sorted, but I don't think it's a computer. Yeah, it's good shape, too. It's five, six feet high, I'm guessing nine feet long. Look at the extra. What'd you do? He touched it. <laughs> Dr. Grant's not machine compatible. Oh, got it in for me. And look at the half moon shaped bones on the wrist. It's not one of these guys learn how to fly. <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> Well, maybe dinosaurs have more in common with present-day birds than they do with reptiles. That Could doesn't be. look very scary. <laughs> more like a six-foot turkey. <laughs> turkey, huh? Yeah. Turkey. Six-foot turkey. Turkey, huh? Six-foot turkey. Okay. Try to imagine yourself in the Cretaceous period. <gasps> Try to imagine yourself in the Cretaceous period. Get your first look at this six foot turkey as you enter it clear. Well, hello, hello, everybody. By the luck of the draw, dinosaurs who had been dominant <laughs> over mammals in ordinary times got felled in a mass extinction. Thank you, Creatrix Brit, for helping me avoid becoming felled by extinction for the past 11 months with your support. Creatrix Brit, thank you so much. Really appreciate you. And welcome back to Paleontologizing. Welcome, everybody. The paleontologizing. We are going to have a fun stream today. Adjust my camera a little bit. A little bit askew. I need to think about actually getting a proper lens for this thing. Rather than like the adapter setup that I have, which is probably not ideal. Anyway, welcome, welcome everybody to paleontologizing. We're going to have a special, and I can't believe I'm saying this, a special video game stream today, so, uh... I'm so glad you're here. The inside story of the extraordinary world of paleontologists. Who they are, what they do, why what they do is important for science and society. Cat videos! And their 33 readers have stumbled into the extraordinary world of paleontologists. Welcome, cat videos. Holy cow, and thank you for the raid! That's This is the ideal time for a raid right now. I, uh... Welcome, welcome. How was your stream, cat videos? Holy cow, my name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here on Twitch doing some good old-fashioned science outreach, you know? It's pretty awesome that, uh, that technology allows us the chance to, you know, talk to regular folks, have a, a give and take about science, answer questions live for a big audience. This is really neat. And Dino87, hey, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. As a dinosaur paleontologist, of course, I dig up dinosaurs with various museums across the Western United States. I study dinosaurs. I publish on them in the scientific literature. 
And nowadays, I talk about dinosaurs five days a week right here on Twitch. So, cat videos, how did your stream go? I want to hear all about it. Doing some art, it looks like. Pretty cool. Streamer's real sweet. Drew some cowboy cacti. Very cool cat videos. I'm sure cardboard cowboy would be happy to, to hear about that. Anyway, cat videos, cowboy cacti. Everybody, if you're interested in cool art, go check out cat videos. I, uh, I really appreciate you bringing all these folks here. This is awesome. Yeah. Uh, you didn't dig it? There you go, Dino. Well, uh... Anyway, yeah. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Today, we're going to be having a very rare video game stream, believe it or not. I'm going to be playing the game Saurian. And we're going to be talking about all the dinosaurs that show up in that. This is a hyper-realistic, super-authentic dinosaur simulator game. Kind of simulating a Hell Creek environment. This is the very end of the Age of Dinosaurs. And I've dug up most of the dinosaurs that you're going to see. And Blue Front, 21 months of support from you, Blue Front. Thank you, thank you for keeping me here on the air for the past 21 months. That's almost a, it's almost a whole year, Blue Front. I appreciate you for it. <laughs> anyway, we already have a raid with a bunch of cool new people, like Dino87 and Cat Videos. I might be feeling a hankering for a, a welcome video. Cat videos and Dino87 and any other new folks. Go ahead and type a number one into chat if you would like to see a welcome video to kind of introduce you to this channel, show you what all this is about, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm seeing some ones, okay. Virtual assistant says when you dig up a dinosaur, is the dirt around the dinosaur as old? It is, yeah. Uh, in almost 100% of cases, yes. Yes. Do you think dinosaurs are put together correctly? The bones. <laughs> You're smart. Fair what do you question. think? <laughs> you can do a research I, on that, I, Oliver. I, I never... <laughs> <laughs> Green T206, thank you for the follow. Welcome to the channel. I'm seeing a bunch of ones in chat. We're going to start off the stream today before I dive into that video game. We're going to start off the stream with a visit from previously recorded Danny. As legend has it, that when the music stops, like it just did, and that when there are a bunch of ones in the chat, that is when previously recorded Danny chooses to materialize before our very eyes. And you know what? There he is right there. He's going to tell you a little bit about this channel, about who I am what I'm doing here on Twitch, all that stuff. So without further ado, we'll let him take it away. I don't like talking about myself. I, I let him do it for me. He's frankly a lot better at it. So previously recorded, Danny, why don't you to, uh, why don't you show all these new people what the stream's all about? Well, thanks for present day, Danny. Well, if you happen to be new around here, then welcome to Paleontologizing. You may well be wondering to yourself, uh, well, if this is Twitch, then where are the video games? I'm level with you here. I don't really do much in the way of video games. I'm a paleontologist. My name is Danny Anduza, and dinosaurs are my area of study. But how in the world does a paleontologist end up on Twitch? Well, you're about to find out. When I finished high school, I moved to Montana and immediately started work at the Museum of the Rockies, which at the time was an unparalleled powerhouse of paleobiology. That program was built by this guy. Famed paleontologist Alan Grant. Well, kind of. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the, the guy Alan Grant was you. <laughs> yes, yeah, well, fortunately he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> Meet Jack Horner, the real life Alan Grant. He's one of the most prominent and controversial paleontologists in the country, a dyslexic MacArthur Foundation genius who never finished college and who says he doesn't care why dinosaurs went extinct. To him, the important part is how they lived. 
It was at Museum of the Rockies, under the auspex of Jack Horner, that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist. And a huge part of that I learned by working with Jack's final graduate student, a guy by the name of Denver Fowler, who would later go on to become curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. Working with Denver, I did summer after summer of fieldwork in the remote Badlands of Montana. Together, we dug up more dinosaurs than we knew what to do with, at fossil sites numbering in the hundreds. In 2012, I discovered a new species of Ceratopsian dinosaur, hopefully soon to be published. The next year, we excavated the world's smallest and youngest Tyrannosaurus rex. Then, we dug up a brand new Ankylosaur. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head, and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. Not bad, right? Well, anyway, much like my fieldwork, my research also focuses on dinosaurs. For example, here's Triarchuncus, the last of the alvarosaurs, just published in July of 2020. One of my current projects focuses on spinosaurids. I can't really talk too much about that until it's a little bit closer to publication, so uh, stay tuned for that. Anyway, let's get back to how I ended up on Twitch. A couple years ago, things in Montana were declining rapidly. So I picked up and moved on to greener pastures. I'm so glad I did. And with that new perspective, I also realized that I have very little patience with the soul-crushing bureaucracy within academia. So for the time being, anyway, I decided to take my career in a slightly different direction. I got hired for a job in early childhood education. As a teacher, I get to have a positive impact on kids' lives and help them find a passion for science. Then, when COVID-19 showed up, the school had to close. But that didn't stop the teaching or the learning. We just moved online. All right, friends. So we're going to be looking at a book in a little bit, but I thought we'd start off with a song. At three, two, two. one. Oh, give me a home where the hadrosaurs roamed, where triceratops bellowed and grazed, where erosion uncovers bones we seek to discover for to strike the whole world amazed. Oh, oh, oh my wandering where the, the deer, deer and the antelope play, where sails always his heard of the scourging world, and the skies are not cloudy. It was a pretty easy jump from teaching online to streaming on Twitch. I had my first broadcast in May, and I've been on here ever since. Now I believe pretty strongly that any good scientist should also be a public servant. In my opinion, talking to everyday people about her science is one of the most important things that a researcher can do. I now have a golden opportunity to reach out directly to people where they are. This is what I'm all about, and now thanks to Twitch, I get to share it with you, and I'm so happy to be able to do so. It's my intention to continue this mission of education by answering your questions, providing good science content, and working to grow this channel. And if you could help by following, or if you could afford it by subscribing, I would be deeply grateful. So anyway, to my regular viewers, thank you again for sitting through this. And to everybody who's new, welcome. Genuinely, earnestly glad that you're here. I hope you stick around. We've got a remarkable little community here, and uh, be delighted if you join us. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get back into it. So, uh, present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny, and of course, thank you even more to our friends, virtual assistant and cat videos for those raids. Really, really appreciate that. Welcome back. Paleontologizer. 
like I said, today we're going to be getting into some Saurian, this wonderful dinosaur simulator game. Honestly, in my opinion, the best video game available on dinosaurs, and I'll show you why. But first, we had a couple of questions that I want to get to real quick. Uh, questions are the bread and butter of these streams, you know? That's what sets this apart from, say, a YouTube video or something like that, you know? Twitch is an interactive format. You can type questions in the chat. I read them. I can interact with you in real time. That's what makes this so magical. That's what makes this such an excellent platform for science outreach. Now, we had a question from Virtual Assistant. Uh, where was that? Oh, Dino says, I took a paleontology class once. Very cool, Dino. Did you enjoy it? Was it mostly on invertebrates? A lot of paleontology classes focus on invertebrates because they are they tend to be much more numerous than vertebrate animals. But yeah, yeah. And by the way, how's my volume here? I hope it's okay. Uh, Space Turkey 33, how are you doing? Uh, and Dino video game hype. Yes, cat videos. Where is Virtual Assistant's question? There it is. Virtual Assistant would like to know, when you dig up a dinosaur, is the dirt around it around the dinosaur as old? It is. Yeah. So, that that's what we call matrix, is the rock that surrounds a dinosaur fossil. And yeah, it was deposited at the same time. You know? You also find rocks and other bits of organic or inorganic crud around too. That's all deposited at the same time. That's actually how we date dinosaur fossils. It's based on the dates of the surrounding rocks. Uh, dating methods like carbon dating. You've probably heard of carbon-14 dating. That doesn't work on dinosaur fossils, because dinosaur fossils are far too old. You have to look for radioactive isotopes in the surrounding rocks uh, in order to date a dinosaur fossil. So, like, yeah, the half-life of, of carbon-14 is far, far too small. None of it would be left after the, you know, in tens of millions of years. So what we do is we find radioactive isotopes in rocks. Uh, if you're lucky, you find them bracketing a dinosaur fossil. You might find a volcanic ash layer up here above your specimen, and then one below it. And you can actually find radioactive isotopes in those volcanic ashes. Usually it's, you know, zircons in there. You can date those zircons, and you can get a nice bracketed age for how old your dinosaur would be, based on that. So yeah, yeah. Um, I think Virtual Assistant had another question too, though. On average, how deep are dinosaurs buried? We don't know, on average, how deep they're buried, because we typically find them on the surface. You know? When we are out prospecting in areas that, uh, you know, tasty, tasty Badlands areas, like you would see, uh, you know, places like this, where there's just all of this exposed sedimentary rock right there on the surface. This is what we're after. This is how we find dinosaur fossils. We go out and we prospect for them. We go to areas with a lot of erosion, where the rock is right there on the surface, and we look for little bits that are poking out. We never go and just dig a random hole someplace and hope for the best. That's not how it works. Prospecting it might be the most... It might honestly be the most... Well, not prospecting, but the identification that comes after you find a fossil. It might be the most difficult part of field paleontology. The thing that requires the most skill is being able to identify, sometimes based on tiny little fragments, what kind of an animal those bones are from, what part of the skeleton it is, whether it looks decent enough that there might be more in there, uh, you might want to dig in further and see if there's more of a skeleton. Those are like the the executive calls that make or break a field season like that. Uh, so the people who can identify, like, oh yeah, this is clearly a you know a juvenile Edmontosaurus. They do that by just looking at a tiny little fragment of an ossified tendon or a little bit of a phalanx or something. It's an amazing skill, and. Uh, yeah, but anyway, we can find the stuff on the surface. Lenina was right about that, by the way. Thank you, Lenina. Uh, so I hope that answers your question, Virtual Assistant. Yeah. And Vigilantis says Denver Fowler went to my university. I, he did go to Durham, didn't he? For his undergrad, Vigilantha. 
Did you go look at his webpage or something, Vigilanta? That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh. And yes, I did get to work on my Spinosaur manuscript this weekend. By the way, I've got something cool to show you. On the 3D printing front. Cross your fingers, this print goes okay. We've been having trouble with this particular file. But, uh... I printed part of a baryonyx skull uh, last week, and I just glued it together yesterday, I think. Let me show it to you. Uh, well, first off, let me introduce you to this dinosaur, baryonyx, which is one of the creatures that I'm currently working on. So baryonyx is maybe, it's one of the most complete dinosaurs from England. And I'm trying to find you a decent one. This is a really bad one. Ugh. That neck. Their neck could not do that. That's, uh, their vertebrae aren't built that way. They're kind of unusual in, uh, as theropods and having a pretty straight neck. This is also wrong. Because neck, neck is not shaped like that. Oh, boy. That's a bit better. Yeah. Um, a lot better, actually, in certain ways. Yeah, Baryonyx. This very cool kind of crocodile-mouthed, huge-clawed, spinosaurian dinosaur. What a neat animal. So this is what I'm working on. These guys were fish eaters. And so the paper that I'm working on is about how would they have caught fishes. This is actually a really good reconstruction here uh, with the Natural History Museum in London. Yeah, that's a pretty decent Baryonyx there. I particularly like the uh, the neck. That's good stuff. Um, anyway, that's Baryonyx. And, uh... There we go. Yes. This, uh, the part at the top there, is the tip of the snout of this animal. These long crocodile-like jaws. And, uh... There we go. Show you the 3D print printed life size. Take a look at that. Yeah. The snout of Baryonyx. This is an animal that I've been working on for. It seriously is like a decade now. It's been like 10 years that I've been working on this paper. Um with uh with Denver Fowler. Anyway, I got to work on the manuscript a lot more this weekend. I feel like it's approaching the point where we could submit it once I do the illustrations um, and the references and everything. But yeah, uh, it was cool to finally actually print this thing. And it's also really neat too, just looking at it right here in cross section, how much it flares out around the distal end, around the tip of the snout. It almost reminds me of like a spoon bill or something like that. I mean, look at that. That's pretty wild. Yeah. Uh, so Baryonyx. Honestly, one of the coolest dinosaurs. Um, so yeah, that's what I was working on this weekend. And uh, probably a little bit this weekend, too. Anyway. Yeah. And there's the fireproof one. Oh, yeah, shoot, Eddie Scarron. The one from uh, Jurassic World's Falling Kingdom or whatever it was. Um... On now, YouTube. You can do it. Let's see. Yeah. This is really, really neat. Check this out. So, uh, this person who does. CGI dinosaurs named Digital Duck. And I'll give you the link right here. But check this out. Um, they were very unhappy with how the Baryonyx looked in the movie Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. It honestly looks terrible. They pooched this majorly. Just absolute dog water depiction. Garbage. And, uh,. Anyway, it's really embarrassing that, like, a major Hollywood stu Universal Studios just completely... They didn't just drop the ball 
they the ball fell off of the Hoover Dam into a pool of magma, instantly burned up, never to be seen again. Green Bay Packer fan, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. That reminds me, actually, of something. Green Bay Packer fan, I don't know a lot about football. I don't watch football. I love to play football. I love playing football in middle school, high school, during PE and stuff. But I'm not good at watching sports. I'm terrible at watching sports. I know something about the Green Bay Packers that sets them apart. They are the only publicly owned team in the entire National Football League, right? They're the only team owned by the people, which is really cool. They're owned by the people of Green Bay, right? Anyway. Um, but yeah, yeah. With that being said, let's get into this video. Check this out about Baryonyx. So here's the bit from the film here. Uh, actually, we gotta do this. See, that's much, much better than the original. Holy cow. This. Oop. You know, speaking of dinosaurs, did you realize that so, chickens are a lot like little dinosaurs with feathers? Oh. Uh, Thank you, Fuzzy Finch, for the 13 months. Really appreciate that support, Fuzzy Finch. This isn't good. Hang on a minute. You know, I'm starting to think that that's just a bad file that I'm trying to print, and I need to re-render that. So we'll probably do that in a minute. Um, anyway, trying to print part of an Allosaurus skull here. Fuzzy Finch, thank you for the 13 months of support. Thank you for keeping me here online for the past 13 months. It's a long time. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway. Yeah. And the printer malfunctioned. Yeah, Mayor Space, it's... I think I just have a bad file there. I need to, like, re-render the file. And hopefully it'll be okay. But yeah. Yeah. And Victoria says, it's true. I'm an NFL minority owner. You live in, uh... I almost said Milwaukee. Green Bay. You live in Green Bay, Victorious? Really? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. You wouldn't download a dinosaur. Oh, I would and I have, Necromanty. <laughs> You're closer to Milwaukee? Very cool, Victorious. You got some great museums in Milwaukee, by the way. Anyway, let's check this out. So this is... Oh, the original looks like absolute dog water. Garbage. But here... That actually looks like Baryonyx with the very long, thin you snout. Blaming the dinosaurs. And I thank you, you Travel the World. Did you get your parcel from the mail room? I did get it, Travel. I did. Thank you, thank you. And thank you for the 100 bits. I'll open that in a minute or two. Thank you very much, Travel. Uh, look at this. Beautiful. As somebody who studies baryonyx, is one of my study animals, this is... Oh, this makes me so happy. Look at how beautiful that is. Yeah... And George from New York, coming in here with five gift subs, just right off the bat. Kabow! Tommy really wants ukulele with those five gift subs. Thank you, thank you, George. Really, really appreciate that. Extraordinary. Good stuff. I don't, I don't remember this guy from the third movie, which I did have to see. Unfortunately, I saw the. The third Jurassic World movie. I don't remember him in that. So I assume he gets eaten by the Baryonyx here. Awesome. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's so beautiful. Oh. 
Just look at that. So this is done by one person, by the way. One person did the animation for this and just put all of those Hollywood animators, producers, everybody to shame. Check this out. Look at the side-by-side -side here. Here's, I guess, the original film. Here is the redone one. Look how much better this side looks. Just exquisite. Just absolutely beautiful. I mean, take ah, oh, take a look at that. It's so good. It's so good. Ah, yeah. Jaws done so well, Wimp Womp. It's really, really nice. Yeah. And Vigilanta, I, sh I have shown this before. Yeah, yeah. Just exquisite. Really, really good. Yeah. So yeah, there you go. Digital Duck on YouTube. Really excellent stuff. So here's a link to that again. Um, yeah, very nice. Uh, but yeah. And Schrodinger's Donut. It's not the fault of the artists. I, I don't mean to rag on the artists who, who did that for Universal Studios. It's the producers and the director who like picked the design for it. I'm not saying that they did a bad job animating it. I'm saying that whoever made the initial decision that, like, oh, yeah, this is what our baryonic should look like, that person should have lost their job. Holy cow. This is terrible. It's so bad. It's so bad. And that's the crazy thing is that this, I guess, was some of the concept art, or this was, like, used in some promotional material or something like that for the movie. And there's a few things I would change about it. For one thing, the the ratio between the forelimbs and hindlimbs is wrong. The arms should be longer. The hindlimbs should be shorter. But, again, this is... Yeah. You'll see. You'll see when the paper comes out. But, um... Anyway, this is what it should have looked like. Instead, we got this. Just absolute piffle. Just complete dog water. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh. Ice Allen says they probably said, "Yep, that's a scary looking monster. We'll use it." Yeah, probably Ice Allen. It, they're like they, they completely fail to capture what makes Baryonyx Baryonyx, though. You know, just very, very disappointing. Um, but that's Jurassic World. That's the whole Jurassic World series for you. You know. Uh Yeah. Anyway. Very, very cool. We can treasure this video here. The fact that we have this. I mean, holy cow. Very, very cool. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. They had an extra gator head floating around. Yeah, they had one in the freezer, Golganek. And they're like, we'll use this. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to be looking at some much more beautifully rendered, well, kind of on par with this, really, really well done dinosaurs in the game Saurian in just a little bit. But first, first, we've got some P.O. Box things to open up and some stuff from the regular mail to open up, too. And I'm excited about this, so... uh Let's go ahead and open these, shall we? Uh, let's take a look. Yeah. Oh, and we got a hype train. Thank you there. Especially George from New York. George, thank you, thank you, thank you for your support, George from New York. That means a lot to me. Five gift subs. Why is our, uh, our sub goals not working? Hang on a minute. Here, let's subtract five from our usual one. Put it to 35. Uh, there we go. Ah. So this would have been 40, except George from New York already gave five. So thank you, George. I really appreciate you. Seriously, thank you for your ongoing support. 
There's now five people who won't have to watch ads for the next 30 days. That's thanks to you. Now, thanks to some other folks, we got some other stuff. And let me go ahead and open this. This has my address on it, so I'm not going to show it to you, but... What is this right here? Oh, that's something I ordered. That's something personal. <laughs> that's not from a viewer. But! This is from a viewer. Right here. Oh, and look at this. It doesn't jump up and down anymore in the way that it used to. I used the ratchet set and I uh, tighten the bolts on this much better now but uh, check that is th check this out someone sent this to the PO box we will see who it is from during our PO unboxing here what is this is this this is the gift card Somebody sent me a gift card. Who might this be from? There's no note. Well, let's open her up. Um... Travel, this is from you? Travel the world, holy cow. Holy moly. $50 travel. That is extraordinary. And look at this lovely box that it comes in. Look. My goodness. Take a look at this. Look. <laughs> I need to keep this. And the next time I have to give a gift... I'll put it in this box. That's, uh, that's pretty beautiful. It's, yeah. Look at that. This is, like, lux luxurious. You know? Hardly know what to say. But, holy moly, thank you, thank you, Travel. That is extremely thoughtful of you, and... I will put this toward the generator... for this summer. And, uh... Any other field gear that I might need? So thank you very much, Travel. Appreciate you more than you know. This is above and beyond Travel the World. You are... There's a reason you got that VIP badge, you know? Thank you very, very much for your ongoing support to this channel. Helping me do science outreach here, it really does mean a lot. And I, I am deeply grateful. So thank you so much, Travel. Yeah. Ghostly Ghoul says use it to buy a dinosaur. We don't buy dinosaurs here, Ghostly Ghoul. We go out and we find them ourselves, and then we dig them up. And then, where do they go? Where do they belong? That belongs in a museum. And then they go to the museum. But I could use it, certainly, to print a dinosaur, like I've done here, with these 3D prints. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh... Yeah. There is yet more to open up. What is this? Amazon Movie Mars. To the P.O. Box here. Let's have a look. Uh, I don't know if I want to open this one with my teeth. Let me get my scissors. Let's see here. What is this going to be? Uh... Wait, what? Holy moly. It's a good thing I've got a portable disk drive I can use on my computer. The Planet Earth Collection from BBC Earth. Holy moly. Who sent this to me? 
That is exquisite. Very, very nice. I do not have many DVDs, but I will treasure this. Um, there's no note inside. I guess since this is from a, a third-party, like, warehouse, it's not from the regular Amazon one. Um, but that is, that's really lovely. Holy cow. Uh, that is very nice from whoever sent it. Absolutely. Um, Planet Earth is like the gold standard for modern, immersive nature documentaries. Uh, yeah. Holy cow. And of course, narrated by... I would love to say friend of the channel, but more... Uh, I don't know, we use his voice for a lot of things. David Attenborough. If somebody cheers, I think, 100 bits or 500 bits, you might hear his voice. Um, <laughs> it's deep fake voice. Um, but yeah, yeah. And Schrodinger's Donut says, well, yeah, there won't be nature documentaries on any other planet. So yeah, planet Earth is the gold standard. You're, it's true, if you're Schrodinger. you're a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. That's not David Attenborough. I'm sorry, Vigilante, you were fooled. As a consolation, you could try blaming the dinosaurs, Vigilanta. Somebody might have to do 500 bits. <laughs> Thank you, Vigilanta. I, it's, it switches off between her and and, and uh, Sir David. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, where's the other alert? There should be another one. Let me, Vigilanta, you you deserve to get what you paid for here, so let me, uh, pretend that this is from Vigilanta. It's going to take me a minute to pull it up, but I'll trigger the alert manually. There we go. Uh, cheer alert, settings, variation settings. Um, let's see. That's weird. Some of these we haven't seen in a long time. Here, try this. With sincere appreciation and gratitude, thank you very much for the 100 bits. There you go. Yeah, that's it right there. Uh, let's do that one more time. Play. Okay, now... Uh-oh. Ah. Uh, Stream Elements is having some difficulties. Why are... We've had a number of these that haven't fired in a long time, though. And gratitude. Thank you very much for the 100 bits. Thank you. With sincere appreciation and gratitude. Thank you very much for the 100 bits. My. If you're feeling a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. That was from Golganek. Golganek, thank you, thank you for the 100 bits. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry there was an echo there. I had to mute the tab over here. But uh, why is it that uh, these other ones have not fired in a long time? What's up with that? You know, sorry to be doing some live troubleshooting, but let's see our settings on this. Uh, at least 100 bits. Um... That's so weird. We've not seen one of the Johnny Cash ones in a long time. Uh, bizarre. Yeah. Oh, it's got to be exactly 100, huh? Okay, okay. Hang on a minute. That's why. There we go. And this one, too. Exactly 100. So that's why they keep getting superseded. Or maybe... Oh no, hang on. I gotta change those other ones. So this is me, like, learning coding before your very eyes right now. Give me 30 seconds here and we'll get this sorted. We'll change that to at least. Instead of exactly. 
at least instead of exactly two more at least instead of exactly okay and no other creature in the world looks like a half plucked turkey and walks like a pot-bellied bear. Holy cow, Moonrise Rabbit. Thank you for the 17 months of support right there. 17 months is a long time. And I am deeply grateful that you have kept me here online for the past 17 months with your ongoing support. Thank you, Moonrise Rabbit. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. It does sound like coding, doesn't it? Schrodinger's done it. Yes, yes, indeed. Um. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, an interesting vigilante, yeah. I never learned coding myself except a brief stint editing Wikipedia when I was in, like, middle school. I spent, like, a whole winter break one time just editing Wikipedia. And uh, I learned a lot of Wikipedia's version of, like, simplified HTML. I haven't really touched it since. But, yeah... Um, this is a little bit interesting. I'm not sure what this is, but I'm going to open it too. I don't know if this is from chat or if this is from something else. Let's see here. Mm -hmm -hmm. Nope, that's from car insurance. That's to that. We've got one more item here, which may or may not be from chat. Let's open it up and see what it is. Yeah. It is. And, oh man, I can't wait to set this up. This might not seem like the most exciting, but I'm excited about it. Travel. Thank you, thank you. Holy cow. Let me, uh, cross this off so I don't dox you. Thank you, thank you, Travel. Here's the note right here. Hello, Danny. Hope this desk lamp makes seeing or streaming better for you. It will, Travel. It will. I needed one of these for when I go and do mobile live streams this summer and maybe in April, too. I might be joining my family up in for like a family reunion brief vacation thing for a while and if I'm going to be doing some streaming from my laptop having this is going to be very very useful so I uh, I can't wait to use it holy cow thank you thank you travel that is excellent it really is um, is that a donut cooker uh, it would cook a donut very slowly and inefficiently, maybe big time, big boy. It is a light. A USB-powered light. Uh, oh, and this is going to be great. For when I do streams from my laptop when I'm out traveling. So thank you, thank you, travel. It. This is very helpful. Can't wait to use it. Good stuff. Yes, indeed. Uh, very nice. Yeah. And I think that's everything. Holy cow. So whoever sent the Planet Earth DVDs, I appreciate you so much. You know, kindly anonymous gifter. I wish, I wish I knew who you were so I could thank you directly. Travel, thank you for the gift card and for the lamp. That's, uh, that's excellent. And I really appreciate it, Travel. Holy moly. Yeah. And Nell, that was you with the Planet Earth DVDs? Holy cow, Nell. Extraordinary. Now, that is very, very thoughtful of you. And it's a good thing I have a, a portable disk drive. I can watch these now. Thank you, Nell. Pretty excellent. You about to check if they got in there? They did now. Thank you, thank you. They showed up to the P.O. Box 
Thank you very, very much. Now, holy cow. It's good stuff. Yeah. Uh. Awesome. Holy cow. Well. All of these awesome gifts from awesome people, I am deeply, deeply grateful. I feel like I should deliver what I promised on today's stream. I promised you that we would do some video games. And so let me introduce you to this game right here. We'll watch a quick little video kind of outlining what this game is all about. In case you've never seen it, the game Saurian, in my opinion, is probably the best dinosaur game available right now. It is really, really cool, and it's we might be kind of grading on a curve here because it's produced independently by people working unpaid in their free time. And their prime directive here is to make things as scientifically accurate as possible. This is a dinosaur simulator game set in the latest Cretaceous Hell Creek formation of South Dakota. Check it out. Saurian is an open world video game intent on providing the most captivating prehistoric experience yet developed. Living the life of a dinosaur from hatchling to adult, surviving in their natural habitat. Saurian is unique for being rooted in rigorous scientific data, literature, and scholarship. Yep. Direct collaboration between developers, prominent paleontologists, and other experts ensures Saurian's dinosaurs look, move, and behave as close to the actual animals as current science allows. So Which... Shoot, a whole bunch of my colleagues were contacted by the developers from this game and asked to you know, provide input on certain things. It's pretty exquisite. It's pretty exquisite. If I have anybody come up to me and ask me, Danny, how do you, what was the Hell Creek like? You know, what, what kind of an ecosystem was this? You know, what's the best representation you can think of, of the Hell Creek? I point them toward this game. It is, uh, it's pretty awesome. Florian's gameplay is based yeah. on managing your stamina, thirst, and hunger without falling victim to the environment or becoming yeah. an animal's meal. Players will need to draw upon a variety of skills and abilities to survive. Master Dakota Raptors grapple and pounce to subdue combative prey. Avoid the sharp eyes and bone-crushing jaws of Tyrannosaurus Rex. And yeah. track both predator and prey with keen senses. Brandish your natural defenses as Pachycephalosaurus and Triceratops to ward off aggressors and fight for mates. Survive long enough to court and reproduce and pass on your genes to the next generation. Dinosaurs change dramatically as they age. Yep. What do we call this, by the way, chat? What do we call that? To the next generation. Dinosaurs change dramatically as they age. As you grow from hatchling to adult. Yes, indeed. Ontogeny actually plays a big role in this game, and that's why I, one of the reasons why I love it so much. Um, really, really cool how they managed to incorporate this into a video game here. You'll need to utilize new skills and strategies to match your new niche. Hmm. As you rise from the bottom to the top of the food chain, other creatures will react to your growth. Predators may see a hatchling Tyrannosaurus as easy prey, but they'll think twice before going near an adult. Yep. The ecosystem <laughs> is just as complex as the dinosaurs themselves. Every detail from the tallest tree to the smallest leaf has the same me. amount of scientific rigor based in time. Just very, very cool. Like, every plant that you see in this, you know, it's not like they just took random plants from some stock image library or something like that. All of these were, were made... I was going to say by hand, but they're made by hand in the computer, obviously. They were specifically designed for this game based on actual fossil evidence. Just, I don't know of any other games that have ever done anything like this. This is, this is pretty incredible. On the available fossil record. Yeah. Even the weather replicates what is known of the Hell Creek Formation. This is the closest you can get to living the life of a dinosaur. Yeah. Sorian has been the passion project of over a dozen developers for more than three years. Every member of the team Much longer has worked than that unpaid now. in their free time to reach this point. Fueled Very by cool. shared respect for dinosaurs and the desire to convey a modern scientific understanding of them to a wide audience in an engaging and untapped medium. Now, Sorian needs your help to be brought to life. It already is. It's, it's available. Hell Creek. 
Yeah. Some T Rex. Very, very cool. Um, so, yeah. That was the Kickstarter trailer. It has since been kickstarted and it's going. It's still in like pre alpha release mode or whatever. I don't know video game terms. But uh, it's still like. Yeah. Um, well, you'll see. Also, I was looking at their uh, their devlog earlier. Uh, they're still continuing to work on this game. And this one right here. Come on now. Yeah. Uh, they'd kind of a snafu here. Let's see. There might be some slightly... Some unsightly visuals resulting from clashes between the old plant art assets and our new weather and lighting systems, which we apologize for. So we'll be on the lookout for that. But, man, this is so cool. This is, uh... What a neat representation of a Hell Creek ecosystem. And I cannot wait to share it with you. So let's pull it up. Yeah... Nell says, what other formations are as famous as Hell Creek? Very few. Maybe the Morrison Formation? Maybe the Dejocta Formation? Uh-oh. We're getting frame rate issues here. Okay, I think... I think we might be okay now. Yeah. Um... Yeah. Yeah, the Morrison Formation, very famous. Sa Salem Formation? I'm not even... Uh, Panda Kaizen? Thank you, for the great Dino stream. Thank you, Panda Kaizen, for your great support over the past four months. Really appreciate that, Panda. Thank you. Thank you. Holy cow. Yeah. Very, very neat. Yeah. And Triceratops says, the game looks seriously cool. What, why did they choose the Hell Creek? Because the Hell Creek is intensively well studied. It's funny. Without Museum of the Rockies, they probably wouldn't have chosen the Hell Creek. Um, because, uh, well, shoot. My old institution had the, the Hell Creek project. You know, digging up literally hundreds, if not thousands of dinosaurs from the Hell Creek formation. And... You know, hundreds if not thousands of other critters too. Champsosaurs, lizards, turtles, crocodiles, birds. Ma even a handful of mammals, you know? So yeah, yeah. Uh, and also you've got all these really iconic dinosaurs from the Hell Creek. You've got Triceratops, Ankylosaurus, Pachycephalosaurus. You've got Tyrannosaurus, for crying out loud, in the Hell Creek. Absolutely iconic. The Hell Creek Formation is, uh... It really is iconic. Now, I think we'll load up a game here. If you're feeling a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. Thank you, Neon Coffee Cat. One of the cast from the 65 movie. Oh, Lilith Hobo. In at number eight, we Very funny Lilith Hobo. Tradoon. Tradoon. Neon Coffee Cat, thank you for the 15 months. Really appreciate that. 15 months is a long time to support any Twitch channel. Thank you for supporting this one and supporting Science Outreach here on Twitch, Neon Coffee Cat. Really appreciate you. 15 months. That's extraordinary. And Lilith Hobo, you make me laugh. Lilith Hobo, thank you for the 100 bits. I appreciate you. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jody Fish says it's an economically iconic building limestone. The Salem? I've never heard it. Literally never heard of it, Jody Fish. That's interesting. I guess I'm not, uh, a stonemason or somebody who knows about limestone season building. Yeah. And Vigilante, these are all, this is a single player game. Is that what you're referring to? Anyway, let's go ahead and load this. Oh, first, let me fire up my... Well, uh-oh. Let's just fire it up. I gotta plug in my little transponder. For 
for the controller here. There we go. Because you know me, I cannot use a keyboard to play a game to save my life. So, let's get this fired up. Uh-oh. Is it communicating with this? It better. Oh, I should have tried this before the stream. Usually it's plug and play. Usually it just works. But it's been, honestly, months and months since I've played a video game on here. Uh. Uh-oh. Do I hold this down to pair it? I shouldn't have to pair. It's, uh... 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 <laughs> well, let's see here. Let's load that game. Here we go. And hopefully the controller works. Cross your fingers. Oh, boy. And it's absolutely charged, Moonrise Rabbit. Yep, I charged it beforehand. Yeah. Oh, there's me. As an adult dromaeosaur here, and the... Uh-oh, the controller's not working. Escape is pause. Okay. Uh, yeah, let me try this in a different port, let's see if that's our issue here, um, let's see, we'll plug this one, or that one goes to there. That's my microphone. Can unplug that. Oh, let's try this one. Oh, okay. That might work. It stopped blinking. That's a good sign. Let's click continue. Yeah. All right, and hopefully I don't have to redo all the controls. I forgot about that part, too. I've got, like, a specially mapped controls here. Uh-oh. Oh, no. I've honestly never had this problem before. Uh... What in the world? Did the game update and then this stuff? Controls. Assign controller. Uh, interact byte. It's been so long since I've played this that it is being real wonky. And also my frame rate is really low. What's up with this? Oh, goodness. Uh, how do I get rid of this stupid menu here? I don't want the G-Force menu. Oh, this is unworkable. Hang on a minute here. Uh, it's forgotten about my controller in the months since I've played this game. Oh, shoot. Um... Oh, boy. Hang on here. Oh, we're getting responses. This is good. This is good. Assigned controller isn't doing anything, though. Shoot. Uh... Anyway. 
if we can't get the controller to work, we're going to have to do something different on today's stream because this is... I will literally not be able to do this without the controller. And the assign controller button is not responding. I don't want to restore defaults just in case something starts working again. I'm holding down the button in the center to see if that works at all. It's flashing different. Not flashing, but it's got different. Oh, 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 here we go. Hang on. Here we go. That might be it. That might be it. Uh, no, hang on, hang on. Sorry, this is not the most engaging right now, but. Yeah, we got it. <laughs> Beautiful. I don't know why the frame rate is so low. We if that doesn't get resolved, then we're then we're gonna have a huge problem here. Um, let's see here. Yeah. Hmm. There is. I've got a, a absolute. You know, killer graphics card here. There is zero reason that we should be having frame rate issues right now. This is ridiculous. Not. I feel like this is an OBS issue. Um. Oh boy, this is not good. Uh, let me try restarting the game. Let's try this. And, uh... Yeah. I don't know. Troubleshooting. Troubleshooting. And it's Ark Survival. <clears throat> Matt Image. No, this is Saurian. Holy cow. This is a game that is a thousand times better than Ark Survival, as I will show you. So glad you're here. Welcome to Paleontologizer. While this is restarting, let me reintroduce myself. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I dig up dinosaurs. I study dinosaurs. I publish on them in the scientific literature. And now we're going to try and... Uh, and play a game about dinosaurs called Saurian. This is a wonderful dinosaur simulator. And I think you're really going to like it. The very cool thing about this is that the dinosaurs in it are authentic. They are as scientifically accurate as you could try and make dinosaurs in a game. And oh, there goes our frame rate. Oh, boy. Uh, shoot. Um. Okay, that's a bit better. Frame rate. Back to where it should be. Let's see. Continue. Cross your fingers, chat. Cross your fingers. Uh, and Godzilla enthusiast, I know, right? Dakota Raptor. Uh, the world's first turtle dinosaur. <laughs> oh, here we go. Yes! Yeah. Oh, why did I say that and then the frame rate drops? Oh, no. Well, we'll see here. Um, Alt, tab. Maybe if I close some other stuff, I close Steam. I close Chrome. Oh, but if I close Chrome, I'll lose the closed captioning. Well... Sometimes sacrifices must be made. Let's see if that helps at all. I know Chrome can be something of a memory hog. But we're also getting really lousy frame rate issues here. 
Oh, boy. We might just have to do something else here. Again, this is a live broadcast. You never know what's going to happen. Yeah, this is... This is just not working properly. Oh, uh, boy. Graphic settings? I could try that. Let's see. Game quality. We could try very high rather than ultra. And see if that does anything. But honestly, I don't think this is a an issue with the graphics card or with you know, processor being overloaded or anything. I think this is probably an OBS issue. We've been having a lot of OBS issues for the past couple days. And because that's the thing is that it on my screen there's no frame rate issues at all. It's just in OBS. This is uh like OBS cannot handle this right now. On my screen, it's beautiful and fluid and... Yeah, this is an OBS issue. This is not a game issue. Uh, I hate to do this, but we're going to have to change up what we're doing on today's stream. And, uh, yeah. So, apologies for that. Um... Dude, it's just not working. I was just thinking this yesterday because we kept having OBS crashed yesterday and I lost like more than half of everybody watching. People just go away, I guess, if the stream crashes, um, even if it's just for a few seconds. And... You know, OBS is great. I love that it's free, but holy cow, I would gladly pay 10 or $20 a month for something that didn't crash on the regular and destroy the stream. You know? I don't know. Uh, so let's go ahead and change our stream title and our category here. Yeah. Um, Matt Image, holy moly. Matt Image, you were commenting on the YouTube video the other day, weren't you? Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's so great to have you here. Everybody, holy moly. Uh, yeah. Here. Let me pull up a video to help kind of explain this a little bit. Uh, let's turn our closed captioner back on, too, because that's important to have. There we go. Closed captions should be working. I said closed captions should be working. Why aren't they working? Okay, they are working. Great. Now, let's see here. This is what we're looking for. Beautiful. Uh... So, Matt Ostrom, this goes out to you and your uncle, John Ostrom. Take a look. Where John Ostrom is curator. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to the largest painting in the world. Yeah, we talked about this. 
over a span of about 350 million years from the Devonian period back in the Paleozoic yeah. all the way up to the end of the dinosaur era, the end of the Mesozoic. It's called the Age of Reptiles. So John Ostrom, holy cow. Well, this, this of course, is Rudolph Zallinger's Age of Reptiles mural, and this is just a nice segue into John Ostrom here and his work and uh, the influence that it had upon dinosaur paleontology at large and upon my own life as a dinosaur paleontologist. I would not be here today if it weren't for John Ostrom. So, yeah. Here's the old picture of dinosaurs. The old picture of dinosaurs here. Giants lumbering through lush tropical foliage, gorging themselves on leaves and grass. This is old hat. For years, the stereotype was magnificently represented by this mural. It's a beautiful work of art. When it was but a number of discoveries have been made, and new ideas have been thrown into the debate. And perhaps one of the most important discoveries was made by me. <laughs> yes, it was. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Very, very cool. It was 1964. John Ostrom recalls that he had been digging for months in Low County, Montana, and not finding very much. Time had run out. His crew had packed up their equipment and were heading for their cars. You know, we've been looking for five years before we found anything as exciting as And, uh, Pedropolis, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Thank you, thank you. And by the way, Smorphosaurus, thank you for gifting Matt Image 360 a sub there. I really appreciate that, Smorph. Thank you, no thank other you. creature in the world looks like a half-plucked turkey and walks like a pot-bellied bear. Murderous Squirrel, 19 months from you, Murderous Squirrel. Thank you, thank you for being part of this community, keeping me here online for the past 19 months. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And Matt Image says, did you know that the Velociraptor in Jurassic Park is supposed to be Deinonychus? I did know that, Matt Image. Yes, indeed. I Shoot, I think I tweeted about that here, didn't I? Uh, yeah. Uh, it's because of Greg Paul. Many <laughs> many weird snafus like that can, uh, can find their way back to Greg Paul, uh, researcher and paleo artist. Greg Paul's got some interesting perspectives, but let's, uh, let's scroll down and let's find that. Uh, let's see. There we go. Yeah. Oh, nope. Not that one. This one. Here we go. Yeah. Here's an infographic that I made about Deinonychus and John Ostrom. Infographic photo montage. Artistic montage. Anyway. Yeah. No, wait. Where did that go? Oh, no. Shoot. It was a different tweet that had that in it, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, the guy in the video above is former Yale Peabody curator John Ostrom, and the discovery he mentions is Deinonychus, which we talked about on my live stream last Friday. This was last week. I said it was last Friday. So two Fridays ago. By the way, did you know that Velociraptor, the Velociraptor from Jurassic Park, is actually Deinonychus? It's true. Yeah. I actually really want to make a video about that for YouTube. Like a specific YouTube video. Direct to YouTube. Uh, kind of explaining that. Because so many people seem to think that... That the Velociraptor from Jurassic Park is somehow made up. Or that it's actually Utah Raptor or something like that. There's a lot of confusion about this. Especially among young people who are interested in dinosaurs. No, the Velociraptor from Jurassic Park is actually Deinonychus. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Let's have John Ostrom tell us about it here. Oh, and actually, shoot. Before we do that, I also have to uh, change our streaming category here because it still says Saurian. Maybe we'll do a Saurian stream tomorrow. We'll have to see. But uh, let's change to science and technology, shall we? And, uh, let's see. Your 
Dinosaur questions. Answered. And let's throw some uh, emoji in there. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Yeah. And uh, the Raven says, going to park myself here for the dino facts. Well, you're in the right place, the Raven. And you are welcome to park here. You will not get towed. I appreciate you. Um, yeah. Uh, and Nell says, repost those first dinosaur fossils that were set up with the poles drilled through their bones directly and can't be repositioned because fragility, despite being positioned wrong. Makes me wonder if folks would be brave enough to risk doing histo on those bones. Or would it be a no-go because of the potential contamination? It would be a no-go, Nell, because the middle of the bones is gone. Because they drilled that part out. So you don't have the growth rings from the center of the bone. You're missing some of the data. So, yeah, doing histo on those is... Uh... Yeah, I don't think that would be a worthwhile pursuit, unfortunately. Yeah. Anyway, that's why we don't... That's why we don't <laughs> drill metal poles into bones anymore. Yeah. Anyway, let's see what John Ostrom... Uh, ...has to say about Deinonychus here. Uh, ...for five years before we found anything as exciting as this. Yeah. Close to where the cars were parked... Ostrom noticed something in the rock. Uh, and by the way, that's a beautiful place to find any fossil next to where the trucks are parked. <laughs> that means you don't have to carry everything six miles uphill both ways back to the vehicles. You know, if you're going to make an important discovery, it better be close to the road or it better be close to where you can park the trucks. So good for him. Holy cow. Uh... This is back at I think Rainbow Butte in uh, in Montana. The cars were parked. Ostrom noticed something in the rock. Since his yeah. tools were already stowed away, he began to scrape the dirt with his fingernails. This is what he saw first. Startling. I, I couldn't From the claw. what I was looking at. Notice the extraordinarily large claws, sharp, yeah. curved, clearly the hands of a predaceous animal. Yep. Uh, associated, found very close to this, uh, was this object, obviously a claw, which I thought belonged to the hand because it looks very much like the claws on those fingers. Although. But there was no place for it to fit. Yep. And I puzzled over that for some time. But we found the answer. Yeah. Turns it's out a that the claw didn't belong to the hand at all. It's a foot claw. In fact, it belonged to the foot. Very and cool. Something more came to light in our quarry. And uh, I'll show you just a part of it. Bits and pieces of the tail. Yeah, look at those Pace ossified tendons. Bundles of ossified tendons all yeah. along each right side, left side, underneath. This made the tail completely stiff, like a what I picture as a balancing pole. It kept the animal, helped the animal keep its balance while it was using those sickles on its feet or killing whatever it was hungry for. There you go. Very cool stuff. Yeah. Deinonychus. Terrible claw. What a great a name. killing machine that came into being more than a hundred million years ago. By the way, does that skull look familiar to anybody, perhaps? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Would not want to mess with those? Yes, indeed, Kerrigan. Yes, indeed. Um, yeah. Deinonychus. This is actually kind of an old representation of what the skull would look like. The modern one is a bit taller at the front and a bit shorter at the back so it's not quite as like triangle shaped see how it like it comes to a point right here it goes and then comes to a point right here 
a modern reprint like uh reconstruction of a Deinonica skull based on better fossil material. Would look a little something like uh like this. There we go. Not quite as dramatic with the pointiness at the front or the tallness at the back. Yeah. And a, a bit more consistent with what we see in other dromaeosaurs. Like this. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, this was the first good dromaeosaur found in North America. And so, yeah. It makes sense it might be reconstructed a little bit. You know, it wouldn't... This is not going to be like our final picture of what this animal looked like right here. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hope that makes sense. And Aditya says, is that a dinosaur from your emote? No, it's not, Aditya. No, no. It's this skull right here, though. Yeah. Now, the one from the, the yes emote is a Tyrannosaurus skull. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway. But it, it kind of speaks to how influential, influential John Ostrom was and how earth-shattering this dinosaur was that to this very day, you still see reconstructions of the skull that look just like this. You know? This is, this is still what you see. Even though now we think it would have looked a lot more... <sighs> like this, maybe. Yeah. Anywho. To snatch and rend its prey. Yeah. Keeping its balance by the remarkable adaptation in its tail. Very cool. Like the galumping brutes in the Yale Muro, but a speedy acrobat, a racer. Yep. Yeah. Oh, this is going to be dramatic and uh, a little bit grisly, maybe. This is an ornithomimosaur being chased by some Deinonychus here. Yeah, anyway. And then we get into some other stuff in this documentary about dinosaur speed and racehorses and yada yada. Uh, anyway, here's a link to this video if you'd like to watch the whole thing. It's from an old PBS documentary about dinosaurs. But yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, dinosaurs could have allergies, says Basil. That might be more of a human thing, Basil. I don't know. Yeah. Well, the dogs can also get allergies, too, huh? Thank you, Nell, for the hydrate. Yeah. Anyway. That image. It is so great to have you here. And it's so cool that John Ostrom is your uncle, apparently. John Ostrom helped change the course of dinosaur paleontology. I mean, seriously. Um, yeah. Maybe I'll show you another quick clip here. There we go. I know we just watched this when we had our Deinonychus episode, but we'll, uh, we'll watch it again real quick, and then we'll get into some other stuff. hard to believe that birds and dinosaurs were related most of the dinosaurs that the public there's my old boss jack horner and so here's the thing is that jack horner my old boss was influenced by john ostrom in fact you can almost kind of trace jack horner's paleontological pedigree through john ostrom and then back into the the earliest pioneers of american dinosaur paleontology like Cope and Marsh and Joseph Lighty. So, you know, this is a, a legacy that continues to this day. This is a, a lineage that first started back in the 1870s and continues into the present. In fact, let's let's trace that real quick, actually. Um, let's see. John H. Ostrom. John Harold Ostrom uh, was an American paleontologist who revolutionized modern understanding of dinosaurs in the 1960s. Yeah. 
Uh, so Ostrom was a student of Ned Colbert and Edwin H. Colbert I think was a student of Henry Fairfield Osborne. Uh, thank you, Kennedy, for the eight months of support. I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, Kennedy. Uh, um, let's find, uh... Edwin H. Colbert here, who was John Ostrom's advisor. And Colbert studied under... under Osborne, right? Uh, let's see... Let's see. Works, references. Yep, he was a protege of Henry Fairfield Osborne, who himself was a protege of Edward Drinker Cope, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So here's Osborne right here. This is the guy who named Tyrannosaurus Rex and Velociraptor. Henry Fairfield Osborne. He was a real jerk in in life, but he knew how to name a dinosaur. <laughs> That's why uh, Tyrannosaurus and Velociraptor are uh, they're such beautiful names. And uh, anyway, yeah. But he worked under Edward Drinker Cope. Let's see, right? Oh, boy. Let's do a control F. There you go. He was mentored by paleontologist Edward Drinker Cope, who was one of the two main paleontologists in the Great Bone Wars of the late latest 1800s. Yeah. Uh, and Cope himself... It's funny. Like, just about every American vertebrate paleontologist... You can kind of trace their origins back to Cope or to Marsh. And I guess I'm from the Cope side of the family tree. So, yeah. Cadmo uh, says Cope was quite racist. Well, shoot, a lot of people were back then. It was not... Yeah, it was not great. It's, even though I might be directly descended from Cope in a certain way. You know, I think Marsh was... Uh, There we go. Marsh was maybe less of a jerk in a lot of ways. And, uh... Yeah. Red. Cloud. There you go. Uh, so anyway. Ed, uh, Othniel Charles Marsh actually advocated for, uh, for Native American rights during the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, apparently, Red Cloud, chief of the... Which tribe was he chief of? I want to say the Sioux, but I could very well be wrong about that. Anyway. Red Cloud stated that Othniel Charles Marsh told the Great Father, the President of the United States at the time, everything just as he promised he would, and I think he is the best white man I ever saw. But yeah. That's Marsh. Anyway, just about every American paleontologist can trace their lineage to either Marsh or Cope. And mine goes through John Ostrom back to Cope. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Uh, but anyway. Yeah. But anywho. So yeah, and I'm not related to Cope, no, except academ academically. You know, shoot, my my family only came to the US you know, or in the nineteen twenties or something like that. They weren't around when people like Marsh and Cope were doing their thing. But yeah. Yeah. Uh but yeah, anyway, let's get back to our video here with Jack and Julia Clark talking about the discovery of Deinonychus and how it helped uh, shape our perspective 
on dinosaurs in the modern era. The shoulder blade of a sauropod. Yeah. Sauropods were a shoulder blade of a sauropod. I think, by the way, I think this is one of the shoulder blades of Dolly the sauropod, whom we talked about. I'm not going to go into that, but holy cow, is that a uh, a big old tangent? Dolly the the diseased and doomed sauropod. Oh, poor Dolly. Anyway, the one with the respiratory infection and in her neck. I think this is the same specimen here. And yeah, sauropods were gigantic. Scientists thought that dinosaurs were cold-blooded and slow-moving, like other reptiles. Hmm. Well, people couldn't imagine dinosaurs being agile and hopping around. They look at these big giant things and they lumber. Sauropods definitely were lumbering animals. I mean, they're they're big. Ben Until in 1963, yeah. John Ostrom discovered a fossil in the Badlands of Montana that challenged that view. So I think I want to say this is John Ostrom right here in 1963. I mean, you could compare that face right there to uh not this one. This is Marsh. To this face right here. Uh, are they? Is this the same face here? As... Right here? I'm not a facial recognition expert. But, uh, Matt says, yes, that is John. Very cool. And man, they <laughs> got crazy tan during that summer. Holy moly. Also, notice the entrenching tool right here. This has got to be like World War II military surplus. Right here. I use a lot of military surplus gear in my field work as well. But here they are making a fossil jacket here in uh, in southern Montana. Very, very cool. And you have pictures of him at that age? That's so cool, Matt Image. Really, really neat. Again, for anybody just tuning in, Matt Image there is actually the, the nephew, I guess, of, uh, of John Ostrom. What a small world, and what an honor to have you here... Uh, live on Twitch. That's so cool. That image. Really, really neat. Yeah. Um, very, very cool. How how lucky are all of we to, uh, to have the nephew of John Ostrom watching right now. Matt, it's, it's wonderful to have you here. Holy cow. Yeah. Ben, in 1963, yeah. John Ostrom discovered a fossil in the Badlands of Montana that challenged that view. What John Ostrom first found was was this this claw. Yeah. Obviously goes to a foot. It was not a claw for walking on. Mm -mm. This dinosaur actually used that claw for slashing. Yeah. This was small. With a uh, I don't know if it used the claw for slashing per se. We can talk about that in a minute, but uh Definitely for something, and that claw would be held off the ground to keep it sharp. It ran upright on two. And you have a great stream, Smorphosaurus. Thank you for being here. Appreciate you. Inonychus was yeah. small, with a delicate build. It ran upright on two legs. It had a long, stiff tail for balance. Yeah. Not all dinosaurs were big and lumbering. Bostrom hypothesized that the animal would scale its prey and start using its slashing claw and probably eating the animal while it was alive. Yeah. It's a cool paper if you ever get a chance to read it. Ostrom, 1969. Set off a revolution. What if dinosaurs weren't slow, but warm-blooded and fast-moving, like birds? Yep. When Ostrom compared Deinonychus to Archaeopteryx, he saw that they both had yeah. lightly built hollow bones. And they shared even more features, including long arms and similar hip and shoulder bones. So it's not cat equivalent, Basil. Think of it as being eagle or hawk equivalent. Here. Because as we now recognize, these animals actually had wings. Let me show you. Yeah. 
Yeah, here we go. This is our modern picture of Deinonychus. Like this, or... Mind you, a decent one. Like that. So we now think that these animals... Well, we know that they had feathers all over their bodies. We've got extensive fossil evidence showing that. We now think that they would have basically stood on top of their prey using those those vicious claws that you saw there. They would sink that into the back of their prey and stand on top of it and basically eat it alive. Which is really grisly, but also really cool. There's a beautiful, beautiful image of Deinonychus right there. Think of this as a big, weird, ground-running eagle or a hawk or something like that. You know, just cruising along, looking for things to jump on top of, sink its claws into and eat while it's still mo moving. While the, while the heart is still beating, it's already eating parts of it, you know? Like an eagle pulls apart a fish. There you go, Ice Allen, yeah. Yeah. And Kerrigan's is so different from how I used to picture them. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. Which, again, brings me to... This webcomic from a few years ago. This is... I love this because it actually references a scientific paper right here. There's a citation right there. This is my old boss, Denver Fowler. My old crew chief, Denver Fowler. Old crew chief and current collaborator on some papers. But, uh... Yeah, speaking of having your mind changed about feathered dinosaurs... I'll just, we'll just go through this like it's a radio play. So this young lady approaches and she goes, What are you reading about? And the little girl says, Dinosaurs. The young woman goes, Oh yeah. They've gotten all weird since when I was a kid. They used to be awesome, but now they all have dorky feathers, right? And the girl says, Yep. The girl says, This says this says now that they think raptors use their wings for stability, flapping to stay on top of their prey while hanging on with their hooked claws and eating it alive. <laughs> she is silent. <laughs> she sits down to read too. I love this so much. Oh, it's so good. But yeah, this is work that was done by uh by my old crew chief and uh and his co-authors. Yeah, the predatory ecology of Deinonychus and the origin of flapping in birds. Uh, here is a link if you'd like to download the paper yourself. It is really, really cool. But anyway, the idea is we know that these dinosaurs were too big and heavy to fly, so why in the world would they have had wings? And also, what are those crazy claws for? So Denver and co. think that both the claws and the wings are used for the same thing. The claws for hooking into the prey, and then as it struggles, the wings are used to flap, to generate a little bit of lift, to stand on top of the prey as it's struggling, until it just holds still for a minute so, we, so you could eat it, you know? That's the idea here. And this is not, despite the flapping... Despite the flapping, this is not arm-waving. This is not overly speculative. This is based on real behavior that we see in predatory birds today. This is something that predatory birds, the descendants of dinosaurs, do nowadays. Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can find you a decent video here. Uh, here is a Eurasian Sparrowhawk exhibiting stability flapping and prey mantling as well. So here it is. This bird has caught another bird that's too heavy to fly away with. And so what does it do? It's standing on top of its prey. It's using its hooked claws to just, like, try and hold it in place. And it's using those wings to make sure it can flap and generate enough lift to stand on top of it and tire it out. And then once the prey stops struggling enough, 
It'll just start eating it while it's still alive, while its heart is still beating. It's pretty wild, you know? Yeah. And they're not able to fly, Kerrigan. No, Deinonychus was way too heavy to, to fly. But it could do this, you know? It didn't need to fly to be an effective predator. Holy cow. Yeah. Um, so very cool. Very, very cool. And uh, what is this here? Oh, very neat. Oh, this is super cool. But let's shoot. Let's let's take a look at this, shall we? I'm sure this is gonna be pretty good. <laughs> there's the Deinonychus in Jurassic Park. Very very cool. Uh, there's no closed captions available, unfortunately. But let's let's watch the beginning of it. Presented by Mark Ostrom. Very cool. Oh, this is so neat. Yeah, this is footage from the 2015 film Jurassic World. Which is a little disappointing because they didn't put feathers on their dromaeosaurs. It's disappointing for a number of reasons, but that's kind of number one, you know? Yeah. Anyway. Have you ever seen the original Jurassic Park? Yeah. Yeah. Does anyone, everyone remember the shaving cream scene? Oh, no. No? No. What do they do with the shaving cream? Do they wash the tables with it? Like, are there some things on there? They hide the DNA in the, in the can. Oh, Man, these yeah. loudmouth kids. <laughs> that's your twin brother. That's super cool, Mad Image. Wow. Very neat. Huh. And phrase very. I don't think we have any feathery or fuzzy sauropods right, yet. So of, how, Not yet, at least. Seen the original Jurassic Park. Raise your hand. I've seen every single movie. Same. All right. Old. Jurassic Park got it all wrong. Um, well, they didn't get everything wrong. Um, so, if anyone knows anything about dinosaurs, we know that. We know now that dinosaurs uh, had feathers, right? A lot of dinosaurs had feathers, yeah. The difference between like a theropod and just like a T. Rex, an Allosaurus, uh, a Velociraptor, some of those had feathers. Yep. And another yeah. thing is, a, a lot of facts didn't make it in from the book into the movie, right? So um, Michael Crichton wrote uh, Jurassic Park in 1990. And uh, at the end of the book, he acknowledges famous paleontologists for the research among the, those famous paleontologists was John Ostrom. Yeah. Recognize me, last name Ostrom. Who else has a last name Ostrom? Oh, what do you think O stands for? Oh. oh. So, o John Ostrom was my uncle, okay? So, Very cool. <laughs> Oh, uh, that's great. Does he have the acknowledgement at the end of that? Shoot, I grab my copy right here, hardcover. Is there acknowledgements? Oh, very cool. I, I've never actually, it's been forever since I've read this book. Um, I've never taken a look at this before. Or, I mean, I not recently. Acknowledged in uh, in Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park. Yeah. In preparing for this novel, I have drawn on many eminent paleontologists, particularly Bob Bakker, John Horner, that's Jack Horner, my old boss, John Ostrom, and Greg Paul. I also have made use of the efforts of new generation of illustrators, including Ken Carpenter, Margaret Colbert, Stephen Sylvia Cherkis, John Gurch, Mark Hallett, Doug Henderson, William Stout, uh, whose reconstructions incorporated the new perception of how dinosaurs behaved. Very, very cool. So yeah, there you go. Uh, ding, ding, ding. John Ostrom.
right there. Very cool. Uh, so yeah, yeah. And sorry when I uh, when I did the ding ding, it scooted us forward a bit. But there you go, John Ostrom. Yeah, man, this is lovely, and I need to bookmark this. Holy cow! Let me once again provide this link, folks. Go ahead and uh, and juice this. You know, uh, go like and comment on this. Uh, produced by Mark O. And actually, let me subscribe too. There you go. Um, yeah, very very cool. This is actually going to be really useful for when, uh, if and well, hopefully when I produce a video on the uh, the Dinonic or the Velociraptor of Jurassic Park, which is actually Dinonicus. So yeah, very very cool. Um, anyway, thank you, Matt. For uh, Matt Image, thank you so much for uh, for sharing that with us. Really, really cool. Yeah, this is uh, this, this legit. Very, very neat. Yeah. And Doctor Terra, how are you doing? We'll take a look at that Raptor Prey Restraint in just a minute. Uh. Yeah. Uh, that's funny. John Ostrom and Bob Bakker at Yale. So, Robert Bacher was a student of John Ostrom, and I've heard many people say that most of Bob Bacher's best ideas were actually from John Ostrom. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Anyway, Matt Image, your, your uncle John Ostrom, uh one of the the greatest heroes of dinosaur paleontology i can say that you know yeah uh very very cool very very cool so yeah yeah uh and there's micro raptor right there well shoot let's take a look at at uh this from dr terra and yeah here we go Building on the foundation of knowledge laid down by John Ostrom and Deinonychus, we've got this. And shoot, I, I must have liked this yesterday. Yeah, this is really, really cool. Mycoraptor Zhaoyanus, a little theropod hunts in the Cretaceous forests of Asia about 120 million years ago. Uh, last year's research shows evidence of mammals hunted by this dinosaur take a look at this in fact actually uh before we get to that there is a really cool documentary let's skip this song that's too that's too uh downbeat let's do a more upbeat song yeah let's pull this up here there was a really neat PBS documentary that was made a good while ago about this critter, Microraptor. Yeah. Here we go. The four-winged dinosaur. Take a look. Yeah. Microraptor from China, of course. Uh. One day in 2002, a courier made a delivery to the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology in Beijing. Yeah. The dinosaur specialist, Xu Xing, was unprepared for what he saw when he opened the box. Xu Xing, maybe the most famous vertebrate dinosaur paleontologist from uh, from Amazing, China a beautiful fossil look at that it was an exquisite skeleton of a small dinosaur with a feature he'd never seen before long feathers attached to the arms yeah very very cool the animal has feathers like feathers in flying birds so oh, we have uh, evidence suggesting some dinosaur 
could fly. Very neat. Yeah. For over a century, scientists have searched for the origin of birds and flight. And the evidence keeps pointing to the same improbable conclusion. Yep. Somehow, flying birds evolved from earthbound dinosaurs more than a hundred million years ago. It's not improbable. It makes perfect sense. Is still one of the great mysteries in the history of life. Yeah. Uh, and the solution may be in this box. Very, very cool. So anyway, in this, uh, oh, yeah, looking at this animal, Microraptor. There's two different teams of paleontologists that put together different models of the animal to try and figure out how it actually would have flown, or glided, rather. Um, you've got, uh, kind of embarrassingly, you've got uh, Larry Martin and his crew who don't think that this is a dinosaur. They think that this is a some sort of crocodilian or something like that. I don't know. Don't. Oh boy. Maybe maybe we'll get into this real quick before we return to Microraptor. But I recently repurchased a copy of this book, Unearthing the Dragon, which uh, kind of deals with this. I is it in the index? And oh boy. This is supposed to be really good condition, and look, there's a big break in the binding. That's not great. I'm going to have to tape that or glue it or something. Oh, boy. Um, anyway, is it in the index? Banned. Is banned in the index? Uh, yep, there you go. 218 to 219. I think that's what we're looking for. Because that will, uh, will tell us about this a little bit. 218 and 219. So many of you know that, uh, that the, the, the idea that birds evolved from dinosaurs used to be controversial. And, uh,. Anyway, nowadays it's widely accepted because the evidence for it is so very, very strong. But usually, anytime you've got kind of a revolutionary scientific idea like that, you will have dissenters about this kind of thing. And, uh... Yeah... Anyway. Uh, never the rice, right, nevertheless, right after the first G-hole specimens, the, the G-hole formation is where Mycoraptor is from, or that's the G-hole biota, excuse me, Yushian formation. Shortly after the first feathered dinosaur specimens were collected, a few paleontologists with a, with a Taliban-like zeal believe it is not possible for birds to find their ancestry in theropod dinosaurs were quick to reject this new evidence. Some of this group formed a loose association, which has been given the acronym BAND for Birds Are Not Dinosaurs. Band adherents have developed a cottage industry of naysaying and incredulity. Not large in number, band members are noteworthy for their obstreperous evolving rhetoric and their failure to observe modern scientific methods. This really isn't pulling many punches, but it's right. Eh... Uh... Uh, yeah. Some of the most depressing days are the ones I have to deal with the feeding frenzy of misinformation and bad science chummed up by band around almost every dinosaur that is made concerning bird origins and feathered dinosaurs. And it's not as if these guys are stupid, or, uh, or that on occasion band members uh, have not made contributions. Many of them are esteemed scientists. Yet, most of their comments have nothing to do with science. I feel as if many of the papers written by band members should carry the prelude uh, to one of the television shows I grew up with. Uh, there is a fifth dimension beyond which is not known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space. Science. What science ever done for us? TV off. This is spoken like a true band member there. Bumble J, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. Anyway, that's the Twilight Zone. Yeah. Uh, the Twilight Zone. Anyway. Yeah. The most outspoken members of band include Larry Martin, 
a paleontologist from the University of Kansas and one of the four Americans on the Academy of Natural Sciences panel that announced the discovery of the Liaoning fossils. And then we've got a Smithsonian ornithologist, Alan Fiducia from North Carolina State University, John Rubin from Oregon State. That's basically all of them. Them and there's like a handful of creationists now too, but the band people don't really like to associate with them because they're creationists. Holy cow. <laughs> um, it's like, I don't know. It's like having a flat earther on your in your group. It's like, no, you want to disown them. A flat earther or somebody who's convinced that that actually uh, uh, actually Elvis is still alive and he killed JFK and also JFK is still alive. You know, it's like you don't you don't want those loons in your group. So even the band members, you know, are uh, yeah, they don't want the creationists on their side, but. Creationists really love band arguments. It's pretty funny. So anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's hanging out with Biggie and Tupac. There you go, Booty Raider. Yes, indeed. Or the bur bird drone people. Well, that was a joke, Vigilanta. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, here's Larry Martin right here. And Larry Martin uh, does not think that... Uh, that birds evolved from dinosaurs. Decades, it's been a standoff between. Or I should say, did not think. Larry Martin died back in 2013, I think. Two but, yeah. opposing theories. Yeah. One has argued that flight must have evolved from the ground up. The ancestors were running dinosaurs, already feathered, probably to conserve body heat. Hmm. Over time, the feathers could have been adapted for flight. And yep. the bodies became smaller, and the running leaps of dinosaurs evolved into the powered flapping flight of birds. Yeah. But not everyone bought it. And if Freya's furious says, I don't understand, where do they think birds evolved from? From some other mystery group of reptiles that hasn't been discovered yet? Freya's fury? Yeah. Um. Yeah, they don't actually have a good answer for that. They really don't. Like some sort of Pseudosuchian or Kuratarsan group of Archosaurian reptiles that are just outside of the dinosaur family tree. But yeah. It's always a hard sell because with a terrestrial origin of flight, flight that originated from running fast on the ground, you're always working against gravity. But an arboreal origin of flight where you fall out of a tree, you accumulate airspeed whether you want to or not. He's very satisfied with himself in the answer. Scenario, the bird uh, ancestor was a small climbing animal that evolved flight by gliding from the treetops. And that seemed to rule out dinosaurs, which presumably couldn't climb trees. We now know dinosaurs could climb trees, the but anyway. The origin of flight yeah. didn't make good physical sense. But it seemed to be essential to the dinosaur origin of birds. And that made us suspect that the dinosaur origin of birds was wrong, too. So now we know that a lot of dinosaurs climb trees also. I mean, it's... <laughs> it's bad science left and right with these guys. But, yeah. Fossil yeah. expert Larry Martin has been a thorn in the side of dinosaur paleontologists for decades. Yeah, he, he was. Have to explain how you can originate birds from dinosaurs, which apparently can't get up in trees. Years later. And yeah, shoot, here he is in an, an old episode of uh, Paleo World that I can find for you. Um, oh, come on. See here. So here's Bob Bacher, uh, who is a, a student of John Ostrom, whom we were talking about. He's one of John Ostrom's most prominent students. And uh, here's Bob Bacher talking about uh, 
Deinonychus. Uh, yeah, watch. Baby raptor five days old. Well, it's an emu five days old, but a baby raptor would look a lot like this. Yeah. There's an idea that feathers first evolved to insulate a chick. Not a bad idea. So if we could go back in time, maybe we'd see a baby Deinonychus with feathers and raptors yeah. wrap around fingers with sharp claws. So that's kind of funny that, like, even in the 1990s, Bakker isn't arguing for Deinonychus with feathers. Now we know these animals had feathers all over their bodies, you know? Shoot, uh, Deinonychus would look... Oh, goodness. Um... Yeah, let me find you a decent feathered Deinonychus here. That's a pretty good one. Yeah... Um, you can even get a, holy cow, a feathered Deinonychus model from Safari Limited. That's pretty neat. But here's my favorite one. Beautiful art by Gabriello Guetto. Really extraordinary. Really, really nice. This is now what we know these animals look like. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So, uh... Yeah. A raptor could climb with its hands. And raptors also had a back grabbing toe behind the hallux. And it could grab bark with that toe, too. In other words, I don't know if. I think above a certain size, these animals probably couldn't climb anymore. It, I don't know. Maybe they're like Komodo dragons, where the young ones are very lightweight, very good at climbing. And the adults are mostly sticking to the ground. I don't really know. That's how it is in the Saurian game, and I would love to show you that. Except OBS is not cooperating today. So yeah. Yeah. What a raptor could do is climb. Now why is that important? Because birds fly. How did they fly? First you've got to get the bird up in the tree. And to get the bird up in the tree, you've got to have climbing hands and climbing feet. And raptors had those. Once your bird is in the tree, it can begin experimenting. It can uh, put its arms out and try gliding. And once it's gliding, that's a short step to powered flight. I'll just give you my message up front. Try not to go extinct. <laughs> that's it. Phoenix, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. I'll take that advice. Thanks for clicking that follow button. Good to have you here. Yeah. Yeah. It's not hard at all to see how flight in birds evolved from raptors in trees. Uh. But for Larry Martin, Deinonychus in a tree is a flight of fancy. Here's Larry Martin. No, uh, that's not Larry Martin. <laughs> Sorry. That's a dinosaur, although Larry Martin wouldn't would be angry if I said that. But um Anyway, and Phoenix says, I've never seen anybody stream paleontology on Twitch. Phoenix, welcome to paleontologizing. That's what I do here. Thank you for your follow, and uh, welcome, welcome to the channel. My name is Danny Anduza. Not only do I stream paleontology, I am a paleontologist. I do paleontology. I dig up dinosaurs with various museums across the western U.S., I study dinosaurs and I publish on them in the scientific literature and now five days a week I talk about dinosaurs right here on Twitch so uh Vigilante says I am paleontology <laughs> no but I am a paleontologist yeah yeah uh so yeah yeah hear me roar there you go Vigilante and Vicky Sky says, how do they figure out they had feathers? Ooh, Vicky Sky. That brings us to another question here. Or another video, rather. Before we get to Larry Martin, which again, this is not Larry Martin. Sorry for that confusion there. But, uh, yeah. If you're feeling a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. I will. Thank you, thank you, Golganek, for those hundred bits. I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. So, did Velociraptor and its relatives have feathers? 
Uh, well, no, we actually we just watched this video last week, didn't we? Let's watch another one. Um, yeah. When Jurassic Park Here we go. And this actually gets into Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. Wrong button. As well. Take a look. I'm actually going to run to the bathroom real quick. Going to go use a little paleontologist room. But you enjoy this video for the next approximately 45 seconds while I do that. And I will be right back. When Jurassic Park first came out in 1993, it was a pretty groundbreaking depiction of dinosaurs. Steven Spielberg certainly took plenty of artistic liberties, but overall, the movie was so much better than what had come before in terms of recreating what scientists knew about how dinosaurs looked and how they moved. The character Alan Grant was actually a bit ahead of his time. Look at the half moon shaped bones in my wrist. It's not one of these guys learning how to fly. Well, seriously. Back then, the claim that birds evolved from dinosaurs was still controversial. Now it's widely accepted. But in the late 1990s, the science started speeding ahead, and the movies just didn't keep up. Even the latest installment, Jurassic World, shot in ultra high definition 3D, it features dinosaurs that are out of date. Three years after the first Jurassic Park movie was released, scientists in China uncovered a feathered dinosaur for the first time, Sinosauropteryx. It takes very specific conditions for the Earth to record soft tissues like these primitive feathers. The animals had to be buried quickly before decomposing and in fine-grained sediment. It turned out that this part of China, Liaoning province, saw major volcanic eruptions around 120 million years ago. There we are. Provided these very conditions. Yeah. More than 30 feathered dinosaur species have been unearthed there and in some other places yep. since 1996. I think it's more like 60 now. I think we've got like 60 species of, of feathered dinosaur. This video was made, holy cow, when was this? Uh, Seven years ago. Holy moly. But, uh, yeah, anyway, we've got a lot of feathered dinosaurs nowadays. Holy cow, we had like two or three new ones just last year. Like Daralong from China. New feathered dinosaur. These fuzzy dinosaurs oh, yeah. were mostly two-legged meat eaters, part of a group that's closely related to birds in the dinosaur family tree. Yeah, and Kerrigan, you've never seen this video before? Well, oh, this is, I think this is the best video, in my opinion. Holy cow, as a dinosaur guy, this is my favorite video that Fox has ever done. Some of the videos, I, I don't know. A little milk toast, but this one, holy cow, is this good. I like this a lot. It's really, really good. That group includes many of the dinosaurs featured in the Jurassic Park movies. Uh, Gallimimus. These guys probably had feathers of some sort for yep. insulation or decoration. Yeah. Includes the raptors. Jurassic yes, Park indeed. Sort of nodded to the new research by giving them a little bit of a hairdo, but their feathers probably looked more like this. And th this is the part of the video that I don't like that much. I know this was seven years ago, and maybe it was difficult to get, like, licensed images here. This one's okay, but the other one that they show is going to be really lousy. Gargoware says there are more than 10,000 species of feathered dinosaurs. This is true, Gargoware. We call them birds. Yeah, I mean, Mesozoic, non-avian feathered dinosaurs. I should have been more precise with my speech there, huh, Gargoware? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. A velociraptor fossil from the Gobi Desert revealed bumps on the forearm. Wow. Similar to the wing attachments on Mars. Somebody do the turkey command. That means the raptors had wings. Oh, and this is a terrible, terrible illustration here. Look at those weird bald legs and the... Uh, just overall, the mouth doesn't have any teeth in it for some reason. Just garbage. This is not good. Let me show you an actual feathered velociraptor. Here we go. Uh, actual feathered velociraptor would look a lot more like this. Or perhaps uh, like this. Right here, there's a lovely Safari Limited model of a feathered velociraptor. This is pretty close to what we think this animal would actually look like. In fact, this is, this is pretty excellent. Really great. So like a big, weird, scary, ground-running bird. Feathers all over its body. Just waiting to 
jump down from some precipice, uh, kind of glide down upon you and uh, sink its claws into your back and start eating you while you're still alive. Um, so yeah, yeah. Anyway, and uh, and I put together an infographic about the similarities between a Velociraptor and a uh, a modern dinosaur that all of you are probably aware of. This is an infographic featuring a Velociraptor and Meliagris gallopavo, the domestic turkey. You'll never guess which is which. Well, no, you will guess which is which. But anyway, there's a remarkable number of similarities between them, and that's that's no coincidence. This is not convergent evolution. This is what we call homology. Homology is when you've got a common ancestor that gives rise to traits in all of its descendants, and they're similar because they're related. So whether it's the bipedal posture, whether it's that S-shaped neck right here in both of them, whether it's the structure of the skull, the structure of the vertebrae, whether it's the wishbone right there, the half-moon-shaped wrist bones, the backwards-pointing pubis and the hips, the hollow bones, or even just the feathers. Both of these creatures had feathers. That's not a coincidence. That's because they share a common ancestor. Both Velociraptor and the turkey both evolved from a dinosaur ancestor that had all these traits together. That's why they all inherited those traits. Basically, everything that makes birds special today among modern animals. You know, the wishbone, the feathers, the hollow bones, the, the S-shaped neck, the structure of their ankle, their backwards-pointing pubic bone, like, all of these things are actually dinosaur traits that birds inherited from their dinosaur ancestors. Those are dinosaur hand-me-downs. So yeah, feel free to grab that link and uh, and save that image. I have one that I uh, saved and laminated and... Uh... Shoot, I forget when that is, but I'm going to be doing a special live stream with Lordy. We're going to be doing Thanksgiving in March or maybe April. And we'll be talking about this then. So yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. The Velociraptor is like a turkey, just a little bit larger, and it's got more teeth. <laughs> Velociraptor would have been significantly more dangerous than a turkey, but yeah. Yeah. And uh, make it... Uh, make it PIS says, are people related to dinosaurs? Make it only very, very distantly. So let me show you. Um, here. Hope, cross your fingers this works properly. It doesn't always. It's a little buggy. But, uh... Yeah. Here we go. This is a tree of life. Showing the evolution of life on Earth. And I told you it was buggy, right? Anyway. So as far as we know, all life on Earth is descended from a single common ancestor about three and a half billion years ago. And then every creature is descended from that. Like this. So let's let's get into our dinosaurs here. There's Diplodocus. Uh, long-necked sauropod dinosaur and humans. And there's Diplodocus and Tyrannosaurus rex. Let's try Tyrannosaurus and humans. I'm trying to click this and it's not really working. Shoot. Um, Alright, let's reload the page. Oh boy. Exit page. Told you it was a little buggy. Anyway, really cool resource, but it can definitely be buggy. So let me click 
T-Rex and us. There we go. Yeah. So Tyrannosaurus and humans. This is an example of a theropod dinosaur. Tyrannosaurus up here. And humans. We are related to each other, but only very distantly. So like... T-Rex is closer to us than, say, a goldfish, or a coral, or a bacterium. You know, Tyrannosaurus is also a multicellular, terrestrial, tetrapod animal. It's got limbs, it's got lungs, it's got bones, it's got all that good stuff. But to get to our common ancestor, you got got to go all the way back to about 325 million years ago. That's when we shared a common ancestor with T-Rex. So our 68 millionth great-grandparent, give or take a few, back there 325 million years ago. Now, humans are much closer, much more closely related to, say, I don't know. Let's look for an anteater. No, that, shoot, that's showing a T-Rex in an anteater. Um... Let's try anteater and humans. Or chimpanzees. I'm really trying to click this and it's it's being a little bit tricky. Humans, there we go. So yeah, we were what, 68 millionth cousins with T-Rex? We're only 31 millionth cousins with anteaters. And our common ancestor is only 105 million years ago. Let's try us and tree shrews. Only 12 millionth great-great-grandparents, so, yeah, only 85 million years ago. When we go down to, like, Gibbons, for instance. 13th million, there you go. Oh, no, that's tree shoes and gibbons, shoot. Let's try gibbons and humans. Yeah. It was only 19 million years ago that humans and gibbons shared a common ancestor. And you see, the closer these critters get on the the tree of life yeah only 15 million years ago oh hang on yeah only 6.5 million years ago we shared a common ancestor with chimpanzees so yeah yeah isn't this cool I, w I would love a version of this that were a little bit more easy to use a little bit less buggy but, uh, very cool stuff. Very cool stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh. And Golgonek says, That said, it is awe-inspiring to remember that, to one degree or another, all life on Earth is related. It's true, Golgonek. It's true. So the next time that you are there, maybe you're walking through... Hate Ashbury in San Francisco. And, you know, some hippie guy walks up to you and he goes, he goes, hey, man, hey, hey, all life on Earth is one, man. You know, strictly speaking, he's not wrong. All life on Earth, as far as we can tell, is related. You maybe have to go back a really, really long way, but... I'll show you here in uh, in this tree of life, you know? Yeah. So here you go. All life on Earth. Most recent common ancestor to today's all life. This doesn't give you like a time span, but we'll jump from that to Homo sapiens. Which is us. There we go. We're going to zoom in way over here. There's us right there. Yeah. And so on this very same tree... You know, we could jump from us all the way to a particular strain of E. coli bacteria. It'll take a minute, but uh, as far as we can tell, all life on Earth shares certain segments of its DNA. 
It's genetic material. All life on Earth originated from a single common point. Articulate reptile. Thank you for the raid, articulate reptile. Listen to that sound. Good stuff. The articulate reptile has a new sound for their three listeners. Thank you, thank you, articulate reptile, for the raid. How was your stream? I hope it was really good. What kind of critter were you working on? I'd love to hear about it. Yeah. Um. So isn't this cool? Yeah, Cyan Streams, great to see you. How are you doing? Man, there's a lot of bacteria. This is going to take all day to get there. Holy cow. There you go. We managed to find the one at the very end. <laughs> ah, oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. MV1994. I got to remember that. One year after Jurassic Park. 1994. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, good stuff. So anyway, but we can jump all the way there to, uh, I don't know, let's look for, uh, what's a, what's a plant that everybody likes? And don't say, don't say cannabis. Or you know what? Yeah. Let's do that. Because I know, let's jump from there all the way to, uh, rose. There you go. Vanilla, fern, orchid, begonias, eucalyptus. Cedar, dandelions, they're all up there too. But yeah, lilac, orchids. Uh, those are good ones, Ice Allen. Yes, indeed. Potatoes, strawberries. Yeah, we could jump to a bunch of these. This is such a, such a cool tool. It really is. Sugarcane, moss, Malus domestica. Is that the banana, Runlor? Malus domestica. Mint, says Kerrigan. Sweet potatoes. Yeah. We're zooming all the way out to get to multicellular plants. And there we go. Yeah. Malted barley. Uh, and it is a cool mug, isn't it? Science streams. Thank you. You know, this mug could be yours. That belongs in a museum. Yeah, if you go and uh, check out the merch store. Yeah. Anyway, let's go to Malice Domesticus. What is this? It's not showing up. That's odd. Uh, let's go to Squash up here. Uh, winter Squash. Because I can't find Butternut Squash. And you got the mug, it rocks. Nice, Lenina, very nice. Yeah. There's winter squash right there. And then we could jump from that to uh, squash bug. Man, that's gonna be a long way away. Who would have thought squash bug not related to, to squash the plant? Anyway, uh, I love this kind of thing. This is evolution, baby. You know? Uh, really excellent. And Pfizer, how did I know you were going to say that? Sometimes you just know, Pfizer. Yeah. Pfizer's got ganja on the brain. <laughs> but we do squash bugs, says Nell. Oh, you should, you should treat bugs with respect. Now let's go back to, uh, uh, let's go to coelacanth. Or you know what? Actually, somebody in chat, shout out the name of an organism. Shout it loudly. And, uh, the louder you shout, the more likely it is that I'll read it in chat, if you type it, too. Uh, yeah, Tony Robinson. He's homo sapiens. Flea! There we go. Flee from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Good one, Bet Medler. Good one. Yeah. Flee from the Red Hot Chili Peppers and from that Star Wars Obi-Wan show. Which was kind of disappointingly mediocre. There's fleas right there. Yeah. 
Everybody loves fleas. <laughs> Uh, everybody loves fleas, you know? Oh no, here comes the Simpsons tangent. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, just like everybody loves fleas too, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, oh, it's so good. Um, <laughs> Papa Miamio says fruit bat. Yeah. We really ought to do a whole live stream of just this one of these days. Uh, just looking at the tree of life here. But this is indeed uh, a website for anybody who's wondering. You can type in exclamation mark tree. And uh, yeah, there's our fruit bats there. The 35 species of fruit bats. Wow. Excuse me. So yeah. If only fleas were mammals, then we could drink flea milk. There you go. And thank you, Harris Bow, for the follow. Welcome to Paleontalidrizing. It's good to have you here. Uh, let's see what else people were saying. Uh, Planarian says RPG fan. I get the feeling Planaria is going to be an entire group of flatworms. So we're going to zoom out of mammals, out of vertebrates, out of chordates, and then into... Woof, over here, flatworms. Holy cow, we've got a whole big old branch here for planarians. And uh, Belint and Lita on Science Streams actually have some planarian emotes, do they not? Or they at least have a planarian character in their roster of science outreach characters and critters and what have you. Yeah, there's only 13 species within planaria? I'm shocked. I thought there'd be like a a hundred times that. Only 13 species of planaria. That's wild to me. Huh. Yeah. And Golganek says, In Hydra Lutris, I think I know who this is. A certain critter who, uh, has got very dense fur and cracks open mollusks on its chest. And a Hydra. Lutris. Yes, indeed. I was lucky enough to see some of these critters myself back uh, in October. In the wild! Up close. It was very cool. Yeah. There you go. Sea otters. They are endangered, but I saw a whole bunch of them back in October. Let me show you some photos. Let's see. Uh, where was this? Let's find those otters. Find them, find them. There's three, four right there. Here's an otter. She's got a baby there. There's another one. Another one. Yeah. Sea otters. Sorry, my, I've got a terrible... My, both of my cameras on my phone are all scratched up, and they don't take good photos anymore. Um... And I don't know if it's possible to repair a lens like that or if you just have to get a new phone. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, sea otters. Wonderful animals. They are so cool. I remember one time back when I was in uh, Monterey, California. I saw... 
Th there it is. There's the sign. Yeah. Have you ever been driving your car and seen this sign before? <laughs> oh, my goodness. That made me so happy. And I took some photos of it. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Very, very cool. Make sure you drive slow for this. How cool is that? Yeah. Uh... You you want to? Yeah, I'm I'm kind of surprised the sign doesn't. Maybe it does get stolen all the time. I don't know. But this seems like the, the sort of sign that like people need to to own. You know, so they try and steal it. I'm sure you could purchase this somewhere. But yeah, as a chunky otter. Well, they they do walk up on land. I was actually surprised to learn that. But sea otters do move up on to land um, and they uh, they walk around a little bit they're awkward on land but they do it check it out I think this is in Monterey California right up there on the beach there's a sea otter right there yeah we're used to seeing them in the sea they are marine mammals, but they can also come up onto land if they, maybe during a bad storm or something, or if they're just kind of bored, they'll come up onto land. I don't know. Yeah. They will do it. They're awkward on land, but, but they can walk on land. Yeah. Look at those big stupid feet. <laughs> it's like a scuba diver walking around with with the fins on, you know? Just flop, 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 flop. Yeah. They're so graceful in the water and they come up onto land and of course they they look like the goofiest animals in the world when they're up on land. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's pretty great. Yeah, they do try. This one's just, you know, warming itself up on the beach. Wow, some dinosaur we knew. Just look at that thing. It's not going to be friendly to us. Count zero. Five months. It's my five more anniversary. Wiggly thank you, thank you, Count Zero. More wiggly, six more wiggly, six more. I really appreciate that, Count Zero. Thank you, thank you, and uh, thanks for keeping me here online for the past five months. This otter just sitting up there on the beach. I mean, it's because otters like this, sea otters, evolved from land-living otters. And otters themselves evolved from, you know, more primitive, more basal Mustelids, earlier mustelids, I should say. Primitive is kind of a loaded term. I should really avoid that. But uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, very very cool. Like what a what a neat animal. They are they're really awesome. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, let's get back. To our feathered dinosaurs here, shall we? Because, man, did we get sidetracked there. Let's get rid of some of these tabs so Chrome doesn't crash. And, uh, again, this is a lousy feathered velociraptor. This one is a lot better, you know. Uh, this feathered velociraptor right here from Safari Limited. Much better representation of what these animals would actually look like. They, they were very bird-like critters, you know. But anyway, there's this. Let's continue. And what about T-Rex? There's no direct evidence, but a few years ago, scientists found a 30-foot dinosaur with some feathers. The biggest Yeah, U Tyrannus. U Tyrannus is thought to be closely related to T-Rex, so it's possible that the most famous and feared dinosaur might have been sort of fluffy. At least when it was a juvenile. I mean, that's the thing is that when you're when you're 40 feet long and you weigh 5 tons, your problem doesn't become, you, you know, you don't have a problem with conserving heat. You you have a problem with 
you have, you've got too much heat. You need to dump it. And so having extra fur or hair or feathers would be a distinct disadvantage maybe for an animal this big. Unless they're used for display or some other purpose. But younger Tyrannosaurus very well may have had feathers specifically for insulation. We don't really know. Maybe young T-Rex had feathers and the adults lost them as they grew. We know a lot of dinosaurs changed tremendously as they grew. So, yeah. Yeah. And there you go, Golganek. Yes. See, you know, little baby chicks need that insulation. Adults, not so much. It's not clear how universal feathers were among dinosaurs, but while most of the specimens are theropods, there have been a few interesting findings from way over on the other side of the family tree. Mm -hmm. These two have bristles of some sort, which yeah, may that, not be uh, bird feathers. I don't think that Pithecosaurus had that. But that's a story for another time. Last year has even more complex feather-like. Yeah, Coelindromius. These fossils may indicate that feather precursors date back to some of the dinosaurs' earliest common ancestors. Yep. The Jurassic World could have introduced feathered dinosaurs to a huge audience this year. It would have been so good! Holy cow! It would have been so nice to have feathered dinosaurs in Jurassic World back in 2015. That would have made my life significantly easier. You know, uh... In the same way that the original Jurassic Park film in 1993 helped bring people's idea of dinosaurs into the, you know, into the modern era, I helped update their picture of what these animals were actually like. In 2015, Jurassic World could have done the same thing. In one fell swoop, they could have been like, yep, bow, feathered dinosaurs. Deal with it, audience, and audiences would have dealt with it and would have eaten it up. But no. Jurassic World could have introduced feathered dinosaurs to a huge audience this year, but it didn't. It's According a lack of vision. Her, a paleontologist that worked on all four films, the decision was made for the sake of consistency. And uh, I'd like to see the context that this was in. So Jack Horner was pushing for the dinosaurs to have feathers back in 1993. Back before we even had 100% hard evidence that dinosaurs had feathers. Jack was saying, yeah, they probably had feathers back in 1993. And Spielberg didn't want to put feathers on them. So, yeah. Anyway, at least we have prehistoric planet. There you go, Rune Lore. Yeah. You have to assume that yeah. they also just weren't up for the task of making feathers into something scary. Oh boy. Feathers can be incredibly scary. They really can be. And, uh. Yeah. Where was that? Dr. Terra, are you here right now? You might. You might have a link to this. I'm trying to find it real quick. Um, yeah. Another, oh, here we go. This is it. That idea. Maybe they just weren't up to the task of making feathers into something scary. Well, holy cow. <laughs> I found it, Dr. Terra. Take a look at this. Oh, boy. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> Let's watch that one more time. Oh, my goodness. Just bone chilling. I mean, look at look at that. Ah, oh, that's so nice there. Look at that killing claw. You do not want to run into this creature in a dark alley or a well lit alley or any kind of alley. Yeah. Holy moly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Feathered creatures can 1,000% be scary. 
Yeah. But anyway, let's get back to what we were talking about with Larry Martin and the band folks and all of that. Uh, oh, and let me give you a link to that, too. Uh, here is a link to this right here. And how have I not liked this? Holy cow. Check that out there. Uh, very nice. But this is not Larry Martin right here. Larry Martin is... This is a hawk. And you can yeah. see that its body's actually flattened like this. And if you look here at its feet, you can see that it has these very long recurved claws. Mm -hmm. And this claw right here, this toe, actually is turned in the opposite direction of the other toes. Yeah, the hallux. That's really meant by a uh, backward-facing uh, claw. Now, I know that Dr. Backer has suggested that maybe some dinosaurs are like this. And it's Bacher, you know? I say his name right. You know, he, he's Bacher. Call him Bacher. I, oh, boy. I'm not calling you Martine. Larry Martin. Anyway. And that maybe even a dinosaur like Deinonychus may have been able to climb trees and perch on limbs. I only want to point out to you that Deinonychus and I are really just about the same size. If you're the, comfortable with the idea of my climbing a tree and perching on a limb, then perhaps you should believe Dr. Backer. Oh, boy. I mean... I don't know how to say this without... I was come out and say it, you know? Facts are facts. A Deinonychus would probably be, be about one third the weight of Larry Martin. Um. Oh boy, yeah. Um, Deinonychus is a, a very lightweight animal. You know, I mean, yeah. Again, Deinonychus here. This is an animal that hollow bones throughout. It's got air sacs and pneumaticities throughout its skeleton and its its guts. This animal probably would have weighed what, like maybe seventy pounds, something like that. It wouldn't have been very heavy, you know. So yeah. Yeah. And Peace and Quiet says Big Raid incoming. Is that right? Peace and Quiet. Well, I am here for it. If we've got a raid incoming, I am excited. Uh, Peace and Quiet. How are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing. Glad to have you here. So, yeah. Yeah. A real men grow beards. I think we watched that uh, last time, didn't we? We we have seen this multiple times. Yeah, really good stuff. That's a, it's a beautiful video. Anyway, this whole group of animals, dromaeosaurs, had hollow bones, had feathers, various bird-like characteristics. Just remarkably bird-like creatures, and they would have been significantly lighter weight than well than like a paleontologist like Larry Martin. Yeah. Yes. And that maybe even a dinosaur like Dionychus may. And Al Hazred. Holy moly, Al Hazred. Thank you, thank you for your raid. How are you doing? How was your stream? He has arrived in force with their army of 169 chickens. That is a tremendous raid there, Al Hazred. Thank you, thank you. what we understand. On the contrary, we stretch our understanding to try and take in the universe. 573918, thank you for the follow. Wiro187. Howdy, howdy. Seville Raid, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Fly, white guy. Yeah, pretty fly for a white guy. Thank you for being here. Welcome, welcome. And Lord Guccifer, how are you all doing? Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. Thank you for uh, for coming in here with Alhazred. First of all, Alhazred, how did your stream go? 
I hope it was really, really good. It is great to have you here. Thank you for the follow, Fly White Guy. Really appreciate that. Alhazred, thank you, thank you for bringing everybody here. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach. And I'm so glad you could make it today. Welcome, welcome. If you've got questions, and honestly, who doesn't have questions about dinosaurs, about natural history, about extinction, about evolution, about all that good stuff, who doesn't have questions about that? Since you probably do, don't be afraid to ask those questions. That's what I'm here for. Uh, I dig up dinosaurs with various museums and other institutions across the Western U.S. I study dinosaurs. I publish on them in the scientific literature. And now, five days a week, I talk about dinosaurs right here on Twitch. And that's what we're doing here, talking about the evolution of birds from dinosaurs, talking about yeah, dinosaurian feathers, dinosaurian evolution, all that good stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. And Snow Lynn, how are you doing? Nice to meet you, too. Welcome, welcome. Well, Alhazred, again, I hope you had a tremendous stream. Can we get one more shout-out? At least for Alhazred there. And thank you, Snow Lynn, for the follow. And uh, McCamby, thank you for the follow, too. Just briefly here, I'm going to call forth an ally of mine, someone we like to call previously recorded Danny. And he's going to talk to you a little bit about this channel, about who I am, about what you can expect here as a viewer on paleontologizing. And what in the world a paleontologist is doing on Twitch in the first place. He's going to fill you in about that. And uh, he is sneaking up behind me right now. He is ready to go. So, yeah, you're in good hands with him. I promise. He'll tell you about it. Previously recorded, Danny. The floor is yours. Take it away. Thanks, present day Danny. You know, people ask me all the time, Danny, how did you first get interested in paleontology? And I've always been interested in fossils from the earliest time I can remember, particularly dinosaurs. My parents like to say that I decided I wanted to become a paleontologist pretty much the moment I realized I couldn't grow up to be a dinosaur. And believe me, I tried. I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is a lovely place to grow up. Except that we haven't got any dinosaur fossils here. So right after high school, I packed up and moved to Montana, one of the best places in the world to find dinosaurs. Just a couple days after I arrived in Montana, I started working at the lab at Museum of the Rockies in the paleontology program founded by Jack Horner. Jack's done a lot of amazing things in his career, but you may know him as the scientific advisor on the movie Jurassic Park. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the, the guy, Alan Grant, was you. <laughs> yes, yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> but we wanted a credible resource that could back up several theories that we were sort of expounding. And one was that dinosaurs eventually evolved into birds. And even the word raptor means bird of prey. And that's something that Jack Horner believes in and could defend if necessary. And Jack Horner became our credibility. It was in this program that Jack built that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist and how to think outside the box. I've done work at a number of other museums around the American West, helping to prep fossils, design exhibits, and educate visitors. I did a fair bit of eclectic field work in various places, identifying and collecting early Cretaceous dinosaur tracks on the Idaho border, Sphenodontian fossils in the gravelly range of the Rocky Mountains, Cenozoic fishes in western Nevada. But most of my work out in the field was with Dr. Denver Fowler, who is now curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. In all, I've worked probably a few hundred sites throughout the late Cretaceous of Montana and the Hell Creek and Judith River formations, digging up dinosaurs. Lots and lots and lots of dinosaurs. And from time to time, that work has even garnered some media attention. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. We found its head 
and we found parts of its armor and plates and so it it should be a new species and uh, much like my field work my research focuses on dinosaurs I'm particularly interested in their behavioral functional morphology all these bizarre anatomical features that certain dinosaurs had I want to know what they used them for right now I'm working on a study on spinosaurs all right but don't ask me too much about that because it's uh, still a project in the works and I can't give away too much just yet till it's published but anyway a couple years ago I realized that things were definitely headed downhill in Montana so I packed up and headed back to the west coast and I've become kind of fed up with all the bullshit in academia so uh, I found myself another job I am now a teacher in early childhood education and let me tell you it's been a natural fit since day one. Now, given that I get to design the curriculum, my students now know more about biology, classification, and the history of life on Earth than most adults do. I've been helping raise a new generation of young scientists. Then, coronavirus hit. In mid-March, when all the schools shut down in San Francisco, I started holding classes over Zoom, and we picked up right where we left off. One, two... Three. I love digging in the dirt with just a pick and brush. But finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I see are rare and ancient things, like Velociraptor's jump or Archaeopteryx's wings, and all the kids who want to see them line it up at a home museum. I realized that I really enjoy teaching remotely. So back in May, I decided to try streaming on Twitch. And here we are. This is my passion, and now I get to share it with you. And what could be cooler than that? I believe that scientists ought to be public servants. Ultimately, it's our job not just to make scientific discoveries, but to teach the public about them. That's exactly what I want to do here. Now, because of COVID-19, this will be my first summer in almost 10 years with no fieldwork. I'm trying to look on the bright side, though. It's not all bad. It, at least I have more time for outreach. And I've got plenty of cool stuff to work on. And if you could throw some support my way by subscribing, I'd be incredibly grateful. So anyway, if you are new here, you should be pretty well clued in by now. And uh, I'm glad you're here. I hope you're having a good time. Anyway, let's uh, see what present-day Danny has cooked up for us. All right, present-day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. And of course, thank you even more to Al Hazred for that incredible raid. I really, really appreciate that. And welcome, everybody who's new, everybody who's returning, everybody, everybody. We're having kind of a freewheeling stream today. I was planning on doing some, uh... This object's gorgeous gargantuans and authentic. Because though they died out so long ago, <laughs> their fossil... Make a way. So we know just what they were like. Holy moly. And sculpt them into still, or rather, extinct life. Thank you for the 17 months of support, Make a way. I really appreciate that. As I was saying, we were planning on doing a video game stream today. But, uh, uh-oh, here comes the cassowary. Watch out. Help me. Help me. <laughs> and look at this one, too. Zyrofante, thank you for the follow. And thank you, Ghost11411, for your follow, too. Welcome to Paleontologizer. Yeah. And we've got two gift subs from Dreamcatcher. Drian Catcher, thank you so much for those two subs. I really appreciate that. That 
is exquisite, and I appreciate you tremendously for it. Thank you, thank you. Look, we're at 11 out of 35 subs. We're like almost a third of the way to our goal for the day. Thank you, Dreamcatcher. If anybody here has any questions about dinosaurs, about the fossil record, about Earth's geological past, about natural history and our incredible planet, don't be shy. You ask me those questions. That's the bread and butter of our streams. That's what I'm here to answer today, especially since the video game that we were trying to play earlier did not work. Or rather, OBS was fighting with Steam. And Merv, holy cow. Look at this beautiful Tinamu bird. Showing us the number of subs that were gifted by Murf. That's a lot of subs. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, shoot. Take cover! Murf is overloading the system with 10 gift subs. Holy cow, Murf! Thank you, thank you. 10 gift subs right there from Murf. Extraordinary. That is, uh, that's really something. It really, really is. Thank you so much, Murph. I really, really appreciate your ongoing generosity and your support of science outreach here on Twitch. I, uh, truly incredible. I appreciate you, Murph. I really, really do. Welcome, welcome back. Thank you for. I'm sure all those people who just got gift subs are incredibly grateful to you. So thank you for that, Murph. Seriously. And Peace and Quiet says, what's the smallest, cutest dinosaur I can recall? Shoot. Peace and Quiet, there's... Oh, boy. There's a few. Well. Sinoceropteryx always jumps to mind. This beautiful little feathered dinosaur from... Uh, the Yixian Formation, early Cretaceous of China. It's a dinosaur so well preserved that we actually know what colors it was. Um, what a beautiful little critter right there. Look at a little Sinoceropteryx. Look at this adorable little animal. There's this. Of course, we've also got other little critters like uh, Mei Long. Little Mei Long, whose name means Sleeping Dragon. Another little feathered dinosaur from the same formation, actually, I believe. And it is so called because it was found curled up in a sleeping pose. Like this. Or like this. That's pretty adorable, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, May Long. It's beautiful. Oh, I love it. Um, and this is the actual fossil right here. Found curled up like that, with its head tucked underneath its wing, just like a modern bird while it's sleeping. Really, really beautiful. Like, look at look at these little guys. May Long. Beautiful little animals. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, make it, uh, make it peace says, how do you know the colors? Ooh, that's a great question, actually. Do we have a video about that? It'd be lovely if we had a video about this. Let me check. Um, let's see. Oh, boy. There's a PBS Eons video about this? We struck the jackpot. Holy cow. That was good stuff. Um, yeah. And Kalek, thank you for your 18 months of support, Kalek. Extraordinary. And also, thank you to Murft for that gift sub to Yuru Zenlux. Thank you, Matt Image 360 for that community gift sub seven minutes ago. And Kalek, 18 months, that's a tremendous amount of time to be subscribed to support Science Outreach here on Twitch. I really appreciate you, Kalek. Thank you, thank you. That all happened during the uh, the welcome video, didn't didn't it? With previously recorded Danny. 
And then we've got a... A Dinosaur Deep Dive on U Tyrannus by Murph. We'll check that out. We'll check out U Tyrannus in a couple minutes, too. First, let's talk about some other dinosaurs from this same formation for whom we've actually been able to figure out what colors they were. Take a look at this. Yeah. This episode is supported by Squares. They were what they ate even... Anyway. Let me just skip the ads. Uh, here we go. Out dinosaurs like how big they were, what they ate, even how quickly they moved. But there is one question that has plagued paleontologists for decades. What color were dinosaurs? Yes, indeed. Shoot, when I was a kid, for instance, chat, you know, man, when I was a young whippersnapper, I remember reading all of these books that I'd pick out from the library in Contra Costa County in California. And, uh, yeah, all these books would say, oh, you know, we know a lot about dinosaurs, but, you know, we'll never know. We'll never, ever know what color dinosaurs were. So just don't worry about it, you know? Kids, just empty out the whole box of crayons and just go nuts when you're drawing your dinosaurs because we will never... We'll never know what color dinosaurs were and how wrong they were. This makes me so happy as a dinosaur paleontologist because, you know, paleontology is all about learning about the ancient past through fossils. And so any time that somebody in the past says, oh, yeah, we'll never know this. And then we actually figure it out. That's pretty special. It really is. I live for that kind of thing, you know? Ah! And here we have that here. Yeah, take a look. It might sound superficial, but trust me, it is not because until we understand their coloration, we'll never be able to fully imagine dinosaurs. We won't know what they really looked like, of course, but we also won't be able to study things like camouflage or display behavior. And we will uh... never know the full extent of just how wrong the Jurassic Park movies are. Thankfully, uh, in recent years, yeah. a more complete picture of- More Jurassic World. Jurassic Park at least tried. Jurassic World didn't even try. Oh boy. Golgonek says, science rule number one, never say never. There you go, Golgonek. Just like Lenina said, the only absolute you should ever use is never deal in absolutes. Yeah. XF Kirsten, are you here right now? I'm sure, uh... Yeah, what is what is the line? Only a Sith deals in absolutes. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Dinosaurs has come into focus, and it is in Technicolor. When you picture a dinosaur, the colors that come to mind probably vary depending on how old you are. For much of the 20th century, for instance, dinosaurs were always depicted in drab colors. Gray, green, and brown. That's because back then, yep. most experts thought that dinosaurs behaved like overgrown lizards, so they probably looked like that too. Even that, I would actually push back on that idea a little bit. Even lizards are more brightly colored than most of the dinosaur depictions back then. It's because while dinosaurs were seen as being very reptilian in nature, when artists were depicting dinosaurs, they often used mammals, big mammals, as their their inspiration for this sort of thing, you know? And what are the biggest mammals that we have around today? Well, whales, but on land, what are the biggest mammals that we have? Of course, elephants leap to mind. Elephants are wonderful creatures, but they tend not to be the most brightly colored of animals. Um, here's an Asian elephant right here. Beautiful creature, not very brightly colored. Likewise, rhinoceros. Not the most brightly colored of animals. One might even call them straight up grayscale, you know? Oh, or zebra, that's a good a good example, Amelia Bedelia, yeah. Zebra also, grayscale, black and white. They might have a striking pattern there, but they are not colorful. 
They're just straight up black and white. You know? And why aren't mammals brightly colored? Well, shoot. Oh, man. Dare we venture into a different PBS Eons video that talks about this? Uh, I think we might as well. Uh, PBS Eons Mammal Eyes, maybe? Uh, let's see. Uh, the reason that mammals are pretty much dull colors is it very well might be because of dinosaurs. Here. Oh boy. Well, let's let's take a look at this video. Here we go. Scientist Gordon Walls wrote a book called *The Vertebrate Eye and Its Adaptive Radiation*. He yeah. compared the eyes of mammals with those of reptiles and birds and noticed something strange. Even the eyes of mammals that were diurnal, active only during the day, yep. had certain characteristics of nocturnal eyes, like those of creatures who are active at night. Walt Which is really interesting. Why would, like, daylight animals, you know, daylight mammals have, like, what look like nocturnal eyes. What's the deal with noted that? noted that many diurnal mammals had large corneas, fewer types of photoreceptor cells to see colors, and a tapetum lucidum, a reflective surface that increases light absorption by the retina. Yeah. All of this suggested that the mammals had retained traits for eyes that were good for seeing in the dark. Yeah, mammals why is that? Mammals also have excellent hearing and a keen sense of smell, which is more evidence that they adapted to conditions where eyesight might have been slightly less important for survival. And this is very true. Shoot, mammals, modern mammals, be they dogs, uh, or be they foxes or seals or whatever, modern mammals like this tend to be very, not supervision oriented, they tend to be very hearing oriented and very smell oriented. You know, a, a dog only sees in black and white, but a dog has a tremendous sense of smell. And a better sense of hearing than you or I have, too. Unless unless the dog's deaf. Anyway, your average dog. <laughs> your average domestic dog has got a much better sense of hearing than you or I do. And a orders of magnitude better sense of smell. But they can't see as well as we can. Dogs can't really see in color like we can. In fact... We as humans are really unusual in our ability to see color. It's Yeah, why do we rely on sight instead? That's a great question. Zyrofant, let's let's continue the video and we'll get into that because it's really fascinating. Yeah. Here, it'd be good if I turned the volume on, During huh? The time of the dinosaurs. Here we go. When they were excellent hearing and a keen sense of smell. Yeah. More evidence that they adapted to conditions where eyesight might have been slightly less important for survival. Interesting. Walt suggested that all of these mammals were holding on to traits that first evolved during the time of the dinosaurs, when their ancient ancestors had to survive by hiding from the much larger dinos. For yeah. those mammals, being nocturnal was probably a good way to stay alive. Yep. This so this is the thing is that like I think what a lot of people realize, what a lot of people don't realize, excuse me, a lot of people in the general public, is that mammals. Mammals didn't come after the dinosaurs. Mammals, which are, you know, our ancestors. We ourselves are mammals. Mammals are creatures who feed their young with milk. Generally, they've got fur or hair and they're warm-blooded and all that stuff. Anyway, you know, mammals. Mammals. You all knew mammals. Mammals today are... Rats and bats and cats and wolves and bears and whales and camels and elephants and platypus, echidnas, pangolins and aardvarks. Those are all mammals, you know? You know mammals. I'm a mammal, you're a mammal, we're all mammals. Hooray for mammals. But mammals like this... They didn't show up after the dinosaurs. Mammals like this actually lived alongside the dinosaurs 
for like 170, 180 million years. Mammals and dinosaurs show up around the same time. But the interesting thing is, mammals first show up about 220 million years ago, something like that. So they're there for pretty much the almost the entire age of dinosaurs. But during that whole time, mammals never get bigger than this. The biggest mammal in the world, the most astronomically gargantuan, ginormous mammal during the age of dinosaurs for like 170 million years is like smaller than a loaf of bread. And why is that? Well, it seems mammals probably had to hide. There you go, Ice Allen. Mammals needed to hide from dinosaurs. For whatever reason, dinosaurs got big and they were very good at being big. Mammals were not good at being big. Mammals, it seems, were maybe kind of suppressed by the dinosaurs. Mammals never got bigger than this because dinosaurs were around and dinosaurs were just better at being big. And they outcompeted the mammals in those niches, it seems. Mammals were kept small, oppressed by their dinosaur overlords, it seems. So yeah. It became known as the nocturnal bottleneck and it had a huge impact on the field of paleontology. For yep. decades, scientists believed that dinosaurs were diurnal and tiny mammals were nocturnal. It made a certain amount of sense because they considered dinosaurs to be cold-blooded, like modern reptiles. If that was the case, dinos would need the warmth of daytime sunlight to be fully active. Which but is not true. But as researchers yeah. have uncovered more mammalian fossils and studied the biology of different dinosaur species, they found some surprising results. Mm. As it turns out, the difference between mammal and dinosaur behavior during the Mesozoic era wasn't quite so clear-cut as day and night. Anyway, rah, 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 rah. it's still pretty clear cut, though. I mean, shoot. The thing is, yeah, the nocturnal bottleneck hypothesis has withstood scientific testing. Take a look. With their metabolism, which made them less reliant on the sun. Yet the nocturnal bottleneck hypothesis still seems to be confirmed by genetic evidence Fossil evidence there you go. and the morphology of modern vertebrates, which yep. looks at the relationship between body traits of different species. Let's yes, start with indeed. Genetics. As recently as 2017, a study used statistical modeling to look at the evolutionary rates of nearly 1,200 genes within 89 modern mammals. The researchers suggested that the ancestors of placental mammals that live with the dinosaurs were small, insectivorous, and nocturnal. An Those are our ancestors at the time. They were small, they ate insects, they came out at night. Another paper from 2018 looked at the genes that code for opsin in 154 modern mammals. Opsins are the light-sensitive proteins that help translate light into an mm. electrochemical signal that the brain can interpret. These researchers found that all mammals have lost a number of genes that code for certain opsin proteins, indicating that the mammal eyes are adapted to low light conditions. Ah. As for the fossil evidence, it's clear that most of the ancient mammals and their early relatives were very small. And that small body size matters a lot, according to a 2019 paper. Yep. In it, one researcher hypothesized that the small body size of mammals in the Mesozoic was directly related to their nocturnality. The climate hmm. during the Mesozoic was much different than what we see today. There seemed to be far less variation in temperature across the globe, and it was generally much warmer. Because daytime temperatures were so high, Ancient mammals wouldn't have been able to cool themselves enough without drinking an impossibly large amount of water. Uh -huh. And modern researchers have also looked at morphology, doing the same kind of comparisons that Walls did almost 100 years ago. One 2012 study analyzed the eye shape of 266 species of mammals and found little difference in the eyes, regardless <laughs> of whether the animals were nocturnal or diurnal. So in yeah. Fact, Almost all of the mammal eyes were most similar to the eyes of nocturnal birds and lizards. There you go. In other words, yeah. since modern mammals have eyes that are adapted to low light no matter when they're active, this suggests that they came from ancestors that were nocturnal. But hmm. there are also little pieces of evidence that have popped up over the years that complicate the story. Anyway, it is...
It doesn't complicate it that much. Anyway, here's the video if you'd like to watch the rest of that. There's the link right there in the chat. But the fact is, most mammals today are pretty drab in their coloration. If you do a Google image search for mammals, like here's land mammals of New York. They're brown, or they're gray, or they're kind of a reddish brown, or a brownish gray, or black, or grayish black, or whitish black, or gray. You know, they're all various shades of brown or black. And you look at, you know, all the mammals here. From, uh... Richard Nixon and Brezhnev there to the opossum just above them, to the pangolin just below them, or the red squirrel. Right there, too. Red squirrel, that's, that's a brown squirrel, let's be honest, you know? Uh, yeah, mammals are not very brightly colored creatures. Whereas... We search birds, holy cow, birds tend to be, by comparison, very brightly colored. And where did birds come from? Birds evolved from dinosaurs. Birds have full color vision. And that, that is the key to all this. Birds have full color vision. Mammals typically don't. We're, we're really lucky. Primates kind of re-evolved color vision. But yeah, Mandarin baboons manage some color because they're primates, mirror space. There you go. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Birds are brightly colored because they are descended from dinosaurs. So let's continue that here. Starting in the 1970s, dinos started to be portrayed as having things like spots and stripes. And there we go. Colors, but not a lot of that was actually based on science. Then it came a major breakthrough from an unexpected place. It wasn't a dinosaur, but a fossil squid. Interesting. In 2006, yeah. while a graduate student at Yale, paleontologist Jacob Vinther was studying a fossil squid with preserved ink sacs. Those are the little huh. organs where squids store the defensive inks. And when uh. Vinther studied them under a microscope, he saw that the sacs were filled with tiny spheres. Other paleontologists had seen these little blobs before, but they thought they were just fossilized bacteria. But to Vinther's eye, they looked like special structures that help give animals color, melanosomes. If you've Ooh. heard of these before, it's probably because you have them. Lots of animals do. Melanosomes are responsible for all of your body's coloration. They're color cells. Your eyes to your hair. Each yeah. melanosome contains some type of melanin, which is a natural pigment. And based on their density and distribution, they can create different colors. Now I know what you're wondering. What in the name of Charles R. Knight does a Jurassic squid have to do with dinosaurs? Well, you know mm. what else has melanosomes? Feathers. Experts oh, yeah. look at the feather of a living bird, like a cardinal or a crow, and see what kind of melanosomes make that feather's color. For example, long skinny melanosomes make black and gray, like the black you find around a cardinal's eyes. But if mm -hmm. melanosomes are short and round, they make reddish colors, like what you would see on red tail hawks. This information can uh. be used as a template for studying ancient animals. So living dinosaurs are basically the color key to extinct dinosaurs. In 2000. Which is really, really cool. So the. The shape of the cells corresponds to different colors. So even if you find the, the cells in a fossil, and the original color is not immediately obvious to your eye, you can look at the shape of those cells. If the fossil's well-preserved enough, if you've got feathers there with beautiful preservation, you can look at the shape of the cells in those feathers, and thus you can determine what color those feathers were. This is how we're able to determine the coloration of dinosaurs. So living dinosaurs are basically the color key to extinct dinosaurs. In 2010, this idea was put to the test in a place that's famous for its abundant fossils of yeah. dinosaurs, China. There, a team of Chinese and British scientists studied what might be one of the most adorable dinosaurs ever, the very cool Cynosauropteryx. Yeah. Cynosauropteryx was the first non-avian dinosaur to be discovered with structures of feather-like fluff back in 1996. Very cool. And after studying the melanosomes found in that fuzz, researchers determined that Cynosauropteryx was 
ginger. Its downy coat was apparently reddish brown over most of its body, but its tail yep. was a little different, alternating between light and dark bands, giving it some extra flair. Vinther and his cool. colleagues used this same technique to reconstruct the plumage of another feathery pigeon-sized dinosaur called Anchiornis. And it turns out that yeah. this dinosaur looked kind of like punk rock magpie, mostly black and white on its wings and legs with a splash one way to put it. on its top. After yeah. this, of more dinosaurs were soon revealed. The four-winged Microraptor, it had dark iridescent plumage, kind of like a raven, and one specimen yep. of the little horned dinosaur Cytacosaurus was even found to have melanosomes in its skin, revealing that the dino was dark on top and light underneath. Pretty cool, yes, right? Yes, indeed. As long as the dinosaur yeah. is preserved with feathers or some other structure that keeps melanosomes intact, scientists can figure out their basic colors. Now, this is all awesome and exciting, but these Very cool stuff. are about a lot yeah. more than just what dinosaurs looked like. They can also tell us about how they lived. For example, in birds, we know that feathers aren't just used for flight. They're also an important part of display behavior. So Cynosauropteryx yep. probably didn't have a banded tail just by chance. Its flashy pattern tells us that this dinosaur may have had something to say to other members of its species, like that he yep. wanted to claim his territory or show off how fit he was for the ladies. <laughs> and the pattern found on Cytacosaurus, dark on top and light below, is a common phenomenon seen in lots of modern Counter animals. Count counter shading. Counter -shading. Yeah, and this is really, really neat. I'll show you a, a very quick video about this, about counter shading in these animals. Um, I think... There we go. Really, really neat. Check this out right here. Yeah. Revealing what colored dinosaurs were was once thought impossible, but the discovery around a decade ago that some pigments can actually preserve in fossils has allowed us to reconstruct the likely color patterns of certain dinosaur species. Very cool. One of the best places to find pigments preserved in dinosaurs is the early Cretaceous G-hole biota of China. And so there's, you know, we've actually got beautiful enough preservation here on account of all the volcanic ash that was unfortunately smothering and killing all of these animals. Um, it was bad news for them, but it's good news for us as paleontologists. Um, because that very fine volcanic ash, which filled the lungs of these poor critters and killed them, also preserved their bodies in exquisite detail, including their skin and their feathers. Discovered here in the mid-1990s, Cynosteropteryx yeah. has feathers preserved that retain remnants of the original pigment that gave the animal its there color you go. of life. Yeah. This means that we can reconstruct its color patterns to give a better understanding of how it may have behaved and to tell us more about the environment in which it lived. Very cool. One of the color patterns seen on Cynosteropteryx is that it had a dark back and a light underside. Mm -hmm. This is a kind of camouflage called counter shading. It yep. works. Because in the and so this is really, really cool because this is something that I learned about before these discoveries were even made. Counter shading is a classic form of camouflage that's been used by militaries all over the world, believe it or not. Especially in the Navy. Counter shading, you make something dark on top and you make it light underneath. And that helps it kind of sort of blend into the background there. You see this in, uh, well, you see this in all kinds of modern animals. You know, uh, let's see. Counter shading in biology. You see it in Sharkos, like this. They're dark on top. They're light underneath. Uh, badgers are the opposite, where they like they want to stand out. They're like, hey, get, look at me. Get out of here. Penguins are countershaded. Dark on top, light underneath. Um, that's interesting. What is countershading? Well, shoot, whether it's a supermarine spitfire... Actually, it might not be a Spitfire. That might be a different kind of fighter plane. Or a Sand Tiger Shark. You get, you know, similar patterns. Um, let's see. Uh, 
Let's look at a Baleo class submarine. They were painted to be. Oh, hang on. Dark on top, light underneath. Above the water line, at least. Dark on the top, light underneath. Yeah, these are not good examples. Anyway, let me show you how it actually works. Daytime. Sunlight comes from above. Yeah. The tops well, are the underside. Anyway, how does counter shading actually work? Let me show you. This is actually really, really neat. And this is practical knowledge. If if you're ever painting a I don't know, a shed or a car or something and you either want it to stand out or blend in. This is important stuff to know. This is this is practical knowledge right here. This is a kind of camouflage called counter shading. Yeah. It works because in the daytime, sunlight comes from above. Yep. Meaning that the top surface of an object is illuminated while yep. the underside is shadowed. Did you get that? Because the sun is usually higher than the thing you're looking at. <laughs> uh, the sunlight's coming from above. And so the top of the surface will be the lightest part, as you see here with this cylinder. In seeing this, our brains are able to recognize things as three-dimensional objects. Yeah. In countershaded animals, the top surface is darker and the lower surface is lighter. Huh. This evens out the effect of shadowing, so countershaded animals appear less three-dimensional. So if you look real close, you can still see the silhouette here, but like, holy cow, that look way different from this. You know, from this to this. So no countershading. Countershading. A would-be benefit for both predators and prey. Very cool, right? Importantly, lighting conditions yeah. vary between different types of habitat. Animals living in open areas with lots of light tend to have a sharp, dark-to-light transition high up on the body. Who can tell me what this kind of animal is? One of my favorite animals, my, one of my favorite mammals from North, uh, from North America. Who is this right here? Hmm. What is this critter? The very last of the Antilla Caprids. It is indeed... A pronghorn. Well, you got that really fast. Godzilla enthusiast, Trappy Jenkins, Hike the Earth, Meskoggins, Jody Fish. Yeah. This is a countershaded animal right here. Dark on top, light underneath. This is a cloudy day, so that's not the best example. But on a, on a normal sunny day, out, you know, home, home on the range, where the deer and the antelope pronghorn aren't actually antelope but that's what the song refers to where the deer and the antelope play on a very sunny day this kind of color pattern would help to hide this animal at long distance if you're a, a critter who's looking to eat some pronghorn whether you're uh i don't know a coyote or a wolf or a you know a cougar or maybe a grizzly bear um this counter shading pattern will make it a little bit, just a little bit more difficult to see. Just enough that it gives it a, just a really small, you know, higher chance of survival here. Um, because when the light shines from above, again, what we see right here. Nope, nope, hang on, wrong video. Uh, merp. Here we go. Let's watch this one more time. Yeah. This is a kind of camouflage called counter shading. Yep. It works because in the daytime, sunlight comes from above. Yep. Meaning that the top surface of an object is illuminated. While the so if this were just plain gray all the way throughout this cylinder or this fox right here, that sunlight's coming from above and it's like, holy cow, there's a fox right there. Yeah, let's go eat it, or let's run away from it if we're a rabbit, you know? But, if it's countershaded, look what happens. Underside is shadowed. In seeing this, our brains are able to recognize things as three-dimensional objects. In countershaded animals, the top surface is darker, and the lower surface is lighter. So imagine if this is there's no sun out, it's just you're looking at this un in a laboratory, and a countershaded thing, the light... You know, the top side is dark, like this. The underside is light. 
This is counter-shaded camouflage here. But look what happens when you shine a light on top of it. This evens out the effect of shadowing. So yeah. counter shadows appear less three-dimensional. A would be You get that? So the same thing is true of our pronghorn there too. So yeah. Yeah. You benefit for both predators and prey. Yeah. Importantly, very cool, right? Vary between different types of habitat. Animals and so this is the thing, is that animals living in different habitats will have different kinds of countershading camouflage. If you're out living on the prairie, areas with lots of light, tend to like that, like this true antelope right here, or this pronghorn right here, even though these animals are not related, so antelope like this, they are not closely related to antelocaprids like the pronghorn. Tend to have it. Right here. This is more closely related to goats. These animals are not close relatives. They've got like almost identical patterning because that's what works in that environment. That's evolution, baby. You know? These creatures have adapted to these environments. They've been sculpted by natural selection to have similar patterning, even though they are not closely related to one another. The pronghorn and this antelope. Look how similar that is. It's pretty wild, right? That's convergent evolution, Murph. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And Nell says, do pronghorns fill the same ecological niche as saiga antelope? I think they're a little bit different. I think saiga antelope live in colder habitats than pronghorn. And they... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm not a mammal guy, so the... I want to say saiga antelope live in areas that are drier and more filled with dust and stuff than pronghorn. They've got special adaptations in their nose. Yeah. Anyway. Tend to have a sharp, dark to yeah. light transition high up on the body, while animals living in closed areas, such as forests, tend to have more gradual transitions position. This is very cool. So forest creatures, like for instance, this what is it, mule deer. Um, the transition is lower on the body than it is on animals that live in more open habitats. Because you've got more shadows that you're dealing with as a deer right here. Did you even spot this other deer behind it? Holy cow. So yeah, yeah, this is a pattern that we see across lots of different animals that live in either open habitats or closed habitats. Or, you know, forest closed habitat versus... You know, open habitat right here. So open, high transition on the body right there. You've got the white that extends much further up the belly. Or low, the white is just on the underside of the belly right there. See that? Isn't that neat? Very cool. Lower down. Yeah. This means that we could determine the likely habitat that Sinusroptrix was living in 130 million years ago based on its pattern of countershading. That is so cool. Here's a creature that went extinct 130 million years ago. And yet, by careful study, we're able to determine what kind of a habitat it may have lived in. Probably lived in. Just based on where that line is on its body. Where that transition is between light and dark right here. Isn't that incredibly cool? So, somebody who works on dinosaurs, I think this is... Man, this gets me excited. I think this is really, really neat. Uh, man, that is so awesome. Yeah. To determine in which environment the countershading in Sinusoptrix would have been most effective, we made three-dimensional models of its body and observed them under varying light conditions. This is really, really neat. So they actually performed an experiment. Excuse me. They performed an experiment here by basically 3D printing a like a modeled torso of Sinusoropteryx and it's just printed out of plain gray filament right there uh no painting nothing just plain gray all the way throughout and they photographed it under different conditions like this this is really really cool we made three dimensional models of its body and observed them under varying light conditions this showed us exactly where shadows would occur in each different habitat. Very cool. We then compared that to the actual color patterns seen in the fossils. 
Yeah. The counter shading transition was abrupt and high up on the body, <laughs> thus positioned to negate the shadows cast by direct sunlight. We can therefore infer that Sinusoroptrix was best suited to have lived in an open environment. Very cool. With this work, we have shown that by looking at paleo color, we can start to understand important aspects of the behaviors of extinct animals, and also better interpret the long lost habitats and environments in which they lived. This is so cool. Really, really, really neat. You know, just astonishing. This is the kind of cool science that we do in paleontology nowadays, you know? I think a lot of people get the impression that, you know, that, that paleontology is just, uh, you know, it's just old bones or something like that, you know? But it absolutely is not. Like, here's this old clip from this. Oh, by the way, here's a pronghorn that I illustrated ages ago. But, uh, yeah, where was this? This is, uh, one of the oldest videos that I have here on the old, uh, YouTube channel. They don't have their own verbs. Fossil science doesn't. Oh, uh, this is an explanation of, of why I chose the term paleontologizing here. Um, yeah. High time that scientists took owner of how their science is represented. Well, first off, having useful vocabulary can help with this. Many occupations actually have their own specific verbs, which help to frame their work in active, forceful ways to keep it from becoming an abstraction. <laughs> but most scientific fields don't have their own verbs. Yeah. Fossil science does. What's the, what's the verb for paleontology? What does a paleontologist do? A paleontologist, she studies fossils, I guess. Or maybe she paleontologizes. And sometimes I worry that this failure of vocabulary might make paleontology seem dry and distant. <laughs> funny. What's funny? Well, a girl like you, a paleontologist. What's wrong with paleontology? Classifying old bones. Oh, bubbles. Anyway, yeah, that's what I'm trying to avoid with this channel, trying to show you how dynamic this science can be and how incredibly interesting this is. It's not just classifying old bones. This is unearthing the mysteries of the past through modern experimental methods. It is really, really cool. I wanted to do something about that. I wanted a word. Yeah. So like any moderately creative person, I decided to come up with my own. Oh, man, what is wrong? This is like a fisheye lens. That I, this is filmed on a GoPro back in like 2017. Oh, boy. Anyway. Yeah. I like to call it paleontologizing. And YouTube. Dinosaurs were the sort of creatures you might think of as inhabiting another planet. And holy moly, in a bad nightmare. Lordy, 30, 34 months of support from Lordy there. Lordy, how was your stream today? I hope it was really good. 34 months. You were one of our longest running supporters here. And of course, Lordy, as a member of my stream team, there's only three of us. Lordy, Ios. And me, paleontologizing. Anyway, go check out Lordy's channel. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, as I was saying here, Lordy, uh, we don't really have a, a, a word for, like, what paleontologists do, you know? You know, ditch diggers, they have a word, ditch digging. Firefighters. Fight fires. They're firefighting. Um, you know, programmers. They're programming. What do paleontologists do? Don't have their own verbs. We don't have our own Fossil verbs. Science doesn't. Well, not until now. Worry that this failure of vocabulary uh, make paleontology seem dry and distant. 
funny. What's funny? And what do mathematicians do? They mathematize. Make it? Yeah, they mathematize. Well, a girl like you, a paleontologist. What's wrong with paleontology? Classifying old bones. Old bones? <laughs> they mathematize. There I you go, Mary Spence. Yeah. About that. I uh, want a word. So, like any moderately creative person, I decided to come up with my own. I like to call it paleontologizing. It's kind of a yeah. joke. So yeah, it, it is kind of a joke. Kind of tongue in cheek here, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is not from a real dictionary. I did, I made this myself. Um, but yeah, yeah. Anyway. Kind of an overtly jargony sounding word, but it also speaks to what I really do in a broad kind of way. Yeah. It speaks to the idea that paleontology isn't just a body of knowledge, like a book lying there on a shelf. No, nah, it's different. No. It's a process. It's something that you do. It's a way to think. Put simply, paleontologizing is looking at the world around us in a way that's informed by the study of fossils. This can manifest in a lot of different ways. Like realizing that the pronghorn Ah. Also called the antelope, happens to be the fastest runner in the Western Hemisphere, and there's a very good reason for that. Why would this animal be so incredibly fast? They can run at like 40, 50 miles per hour. Yeah, you can translate that to kilometers if you'd like to. I'm kind of bad at doing that on the fly, um, as an American. But anyway, the fastest running mammal in North America. Why would it evolve to be so much faster than all of its predators? Well, didn't used to be. That's because until one of its predators went extinct fairly recently, it had to be that fast, just for everyday survival. And Lilith Hobo, thank you for the raid. Welcome, Lilith Hobo. <laughs> I appreciate that raid. So yeah, yeah. Intelligizing is being momentarily dumbstruck when confronted with the sheer size of a full-grown elephant. Yeah. Before remembering that, no, oh, relatively speaking, <laughs> it's not actually that big. Yep, indeed. <laughs> there were once ma w once dinosaurs that were so much bigger than this this biggest of of terrestrial mammals today. I mean, holy cow! Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. And Westy says, so Pronghorn must be getting slower. They probably are, Westy. Yeah, yeah. Because they don't have the same pressure that they used to have to be so incredibly fast. They've probably gotten a lot slower. Probably, yeah. Because they, they don't have that pressure just making them be faster all that time. Those, you know, those American cheetahs trying to eat them. They don't have that anymore. They don't have to be as fast. It's probably a, a safe bet that the pronghorns that are alive today are much slower than the pronghorn that lived, say, 5,000 years ago. You know? So, yeah. Paleontologizing is appreciating that for every tree, every mushroom, every fly, there are over 3 billion years of evolution that went into shaping them. Paleontologizing true. is knowing that if you really want to understand the world and our place in it, then you have to understand the past. It's true. And yeah, you know, not to be sappy or anything, but the act of digging into that past, <laughs> that's the greatest adventure there is. <laughs> uh, and there's the little music montage that they put together. Nope. Oh. Dios mío, hija del pelcado, hija del pelcado. Muchas gracias por el raid. Y bienvenidos a paleontologizing. Me llamo Dani Andusa, soy un paleontólogo. I'm a, I'm a, soy un paleo, paleontólogo de los dinosaurios. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. 
And I, uh, I dig up dinosaurs. I study dinosaurs. I talk about dinosaurs five days a week here on Twitch. It's great to have you here. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Uh, good evening from Spain. Well. Ah, claro que sí. Buenas noches. De la área de la Bahía de San Francisco. <laughs> uh, bienvenidos, Isha del Pecado. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Lo siento por mi... Mi español no es tan bueno. I... Soy puertorriqueño. And el... Lado de mi familia de mi papá. On my dad's side of the family. We're of Puerto Rican descent. Uh, but I am thoroughly American. Soy americano. Uh, soy un gabacho. Lo siento. <laughs> and my Spanish is not very good. So again, apologies. But uh, Gabo Player 2, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Good to have you here. Yeah. And uh, don't worry, I understand English. Well, thank you, Isha. Uh, thank you, thank you for being here. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, we were... This is a little self-indulgent, but we were... We were, I, we were talking about, I don't know, something to do with the philosophy of paleontology and how cool it is that we can figure out the the coloration of extinct dinosaurs through, you know, uh, uh, through intensive study of these animals. And here's a video that I put together way back in. Serious game of paleontology. Gobble player, thank you for the follow. Appreciate that. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the channel. It's good to have you here. Here's a video that I made back in uh, five years ago. Holy cow. This is well before I was on Twitch. But there's a little, you know, uh, musical segment here <laughs> that, uh, that I think you might enjoy if any of you have never seen this video before. Um, it's, uh, uh, nope, I spelled that wrong. Y-U-H-T-U-B-E-S. There you go. Um, yeah, before I ever premiered here on Twitch, I was you know, trying to make science outreach videos on YouTube with very limited success. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. And Iha, thank you so much for the raid. And you go get some sleep. I hope you have pleasant dreams. Buenos sueños. Iha del pecado. Y uh, gracias por el raid. I am grateful. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Here, let's, uh, let's watch this. And, you know, not to be sappy or anything, but the act of digging into that past, <laughs> that's the greatest adventure there is. It really kind of is, you know? Holy cow. Uh, it took me so long to put this together. I was, I was still kind of learning how to edit YouTube videos at the time. Uh, there's Denver Fowler there. <laughs> uh, this is so much fun to put together. Uh fact that animals nope. change through time is accepted by fewer than half of Americans. Oh when boy. Time time television is And that that is totally a thing. Is accepted by fewer the fundamental concept in biology that living things change over time. Fewer than half of people worldwide accept this idea, at least according to the source here. Yeah. Uh, measuring 
the evolution controversy. Uh, it's it's um, it's heartbreaking to me that this is a controversy at all. It's like, you know, it's like, well, how much of the world's population accepts that the Earth is round? Uh, anyway, yeah. Half of Americans, when primetime television is full of pseudoscience bullshit, and a culture that sometimes seems to have abandoned the very idea of truth. Alternative facts. We need more scientists reaching out to the public. Oh, yeah. This video series is my attempt at that. In these videos, you'll see. Yeah, the audio is terrible here. Oh, my goodness. Other scientists, reports from the uh... field, original illustrations, tips and pointers for those of you who want to get into paleontology, explorations of the give and take between paleo and pop culture, and above all, a celebration of that fossil heritage that we all share. Yeah. So whether you're the distinguished curator of a major museum or just a curious member of the public, I'm glad you're here. And I hope you'll get something valuable out of this. My name is Danny Anduza, and this is Paleontologizing. Yeah. Good stuff. I don't know. Yeah, that was the video that I put together five years ago. Holy cow. Was it only five years ago? It feels like longer. And it's only got 900 views on YouTube. Holy moly. So you can see why I switched from YouTube to Twitch. But, uh... Yeah. Yeah, holy cow. Yeah. And, uh... But yeah, Lilith Hilba says people rather listen to conspiracy theorists and politicians. It's a, certainly here in the U.S. that seems to be the case, you know? Yeah, and Cosmos says, I would imagine there are some evolutionists who are... Well, what do you mean by evolutionists, Cosmos? Can you define that term? What is an evolutionist? I mean, it sounds like what you're describing are scientists. And I don't know, there's not, there's honestly not many conspiracy theories that I adhere to. I don't know if I can think of any, honestly. Um, oh yeah, I don't know. People who are more evolution than creationists. Well, you're describing scientists, Godmos. <laughs> Scienticians, says Necromancy. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, thank you, Nell, for the hydrate there. Appreciate that. Cheers. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, and Jim, yeah, that's... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of, you know, dealings in the world, but conspiracy theories or something different. I don't know. And Zoo Smell Egbert. Thank you for your follow and welcome to Paleontologize. Thanks for dropping in there. It's good to have you here. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, shoot, we didn't even talk about this yet. This morning, I might start doing this more often. I uh, I got a chance to meet up with some old friends, like this Triceratops specimen and this one and this one too, in Berkeley, California, just a short train ride away from where I live in the East Bay, San Francisco Bay Area, and that was really really cool. It was I actually got to. Uh, to catch up with some old paleontologist friends as well and watch a presentation by an up-and-coming paleontologist, a doctoral student, about uh, the paleoecology of cave bears, which is really, really neat. So yeah, that was pretty awesome. And uh, I'm really lucky 
this is the same museum that I uh, I worked at when I was in high school. Here's me with the Tyrannosaurus skeleton there. This is a cast of our T-Rex skeleton from uh, Museum of the Rockies, which is now at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. That's where the original is. But yeah, yeah, it was really cool to be able to kind of catch up with some old friends and uh, really, really nice to do that. I'm incredibly grateful that I have the flexibility in my schedule to be able to do that. To not have to work a nine to five like so many of my colleagues. I can go out and, and do this in the morning and then come back and stream to all of you wonderful people here in the afternoons. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I.E. like Yoshi Paper Mario. Wait, what? Is that a reference to Yoshi's Triceratops? Peace and quiet? Holy cow. Yeah. And who's doing the Cave Bear Paper? Nell, here, let me give you a... Shoot. Nope, that's not what I'm looking for. Uh, I'll give you the name of the author. I don't know if this has been published yet or not, but, uh, yeah. Here's a link, or here's a copied and pasted from the email. Dr. Alejandro Perez Ramos, University of Malaga in Spain. The Paleophysiology and Biomechanics and Ex... Uh, an extinct mammalian megafauna and its relationship with global climate change on a macroevolutionary scale. Very cool stuff. Um, yeah. Really neat. But yeah, it turns out cave bears... Cave bears... Um, well, shoot. Uh... <laughs> uh, I'm looking for this old video. Uh, no Nope, that's not it. I'm looking for this old video with... Um, Shoot, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it. Anyway, cave bears. Yeah, these remarkable creatures. Ursus Spileus. One of the biggest terrestrial carnivorous mammals. There's a cave bear there. Uh, there is a beautiful, beautiful rendering of a cave bear done by a person probably about 10,000 years ago in a cave. What I gleaned from this talk, and it was a little bit difficult because Alejandro had a very thick Spanish accent. And also the internet quality was really, really bad. So like between a bit of an accent and then a really low quality audio through Zoom, it was difficult to like pick out all the details. But what I gleaned from this talk is that uh, through his really interesting science done on the, the teeth of these animals, the teeth in terms of their structure are most similar to those of panda bears. They're not closely related to panda bears at all, but convergently, these bears have evolved similar shaped teeth. That combined with isotopic evidence, like isotopes pulled from those teeth, and the shape of the skull and everything else, all seems to indicate that these bears were primarily herbivorous. They were eating plants. They were eating tough plants, too. Cave bears seem to have been mostly plant-eating animals. Which is really, really interesting. And as the climate continued to change throughout the Pleistocene, it may have been at the last glacial maximum they actually went extinct. 
So yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Cosmos. Not everything can be explained by. Well, I mean, that's a matter of opinion, Cosmos. Cosmos. There's a wonderful book I'd like to recommend to you, actually. Um, holy cow, because I agree with you that religion and science can absolutely coexist, Cosmos. Yeah, a hundred percent. I totally agree with you there. Um, let me see if I can find you a really cheap copy of of this book. Um, yeah. There we go. Oh, that's way more expensive than I was hoping. But, I know, you can find it on Amazon, maybe, for cheaper than this. But, uh, I know a lot of folks who come from a very, like, anti-evolution perspective. When... When they've read this book, suddenly things click for them. And I think, Cosmos, this might be really, really helpful to you. Uh, it's by Francis S. Collins, who used to be, I think, the head of the Human Genome Project. He himself is a devout Christian. He's a believer. The book's called The Language of God, A Scientist Presents Evidence for Belief by Francis S. Collins. And, uh, I think this might be really, really useful to you, Cosmos. Um... Yeah. Um, that's not what I'm looking for. Where is it? Uh, but yeah. Where did the, uh, I don't know if I'm going to find a, a short, pithy video about this. But, um,. Anyway, well, this, hey, we're taking a risk here. Let's see if this is any good, but this is Francis Collins himself, and is, this is just going to be a photo with audio played underneath, isn't it? What about intelligent design? Now, here I know I'm getting a little closer to the edge uh, with an audience like this, where probably uh, there are quite a few of you here, uh, perhaps. Uh, we're here, I'll give you the link to this, but we're not going to watch this whole thing. I thought this was going to be a video video, and it's not. It's just audio recording over a picture. But anyway, I'd like to reemphasize that science does not have to be the enemy, or re rather religion doesn't have to be the enemy of science. In science, we figure out what's true by testing things, you know? Ruthlessly testing things, oftentimes. That's what science is all about. Religion does not have to be the enemy of science. Take Francis Collins, for instance. You know? Uh, a devout Christian who himself is an evolutionary biologist. And you can check that out in his book, The Language of God. So, yeah. There you go. Um, anyway. Uh, Cadmus, I hope that's useful to you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, and you read that book? Uh, Zyra Fett, did you, did you like it? Yeah, I remember I read it ages ago. But yeah, yeah. Anyway. Um, shoot, we never, do we ever finish this video? Let's, let's finish this. Oh, well, okay, there's the citations at the end of the video. But anyway, really, really cool dimensional object. that we're actually able to uh, to run these tests in paleontology and figure out the habitats in which these animals may have lived just based on something as simple as countershading. That, to me, is really, really cool. So, yeah. Yeah. Very neat stuff. Uh, and, you know, with that said... Oh, Let's finish this video here. Again, we're climbing our way back up the rabbit hole and going to these videos that we stopped in the middle of. So... 
Here we go. It was put to the test in a place that's famous for its abundant fossils of feathered dinosaurs. Yeah. There, a team of Chinese and British scientists studied what might be one of the most adorable dinosaurs. And Nell, sure thing, Nell, yeah. Sized yeah. Sinosauropteryx. Sinosauropteryx was the first non-avian dinosaur to be discovered with structures of feather-like fluff back in 1996. Mm -hmm. And after studying the melanosomes found in that fuzz, researchers determined that Sinosauropteryx was ginger. Its down yep. coat was apparently Very cool. brown over most of its body, but its tail was a little different, alternating between light and dark bands. It is like climbing the tree in that Lindbergh image, yes. Colleagues yeah. colleagues used this same technique to reconstruct the plumage of another feathery pigeon-sized dinosaur called Anchiornis. Anchiornis. Turns out that this dinosaur yeah. looked kind of like punk rock magpie, mostly black and white on its wings and legs with a splash of red on its top. After this, yeah. more dinosaurs were soon revealed. The four-winged Microraptor, it had dark iridescent plumage, kind of like a raven, and one specimen yep. of the little horned dinosaur Cytacosaurus was even found to have melan. And I like how he's described as a horned dinosaur. It is a ceratopsian. No horns, though. Melanosomes in its skin, revealing yeah. that the animal was dark on top and light underneath. Pretty cool, right? As long as the dinosaur is preserved with feathers or some other structure that keeps melanosomes intact, scientists can figure out their basic colors. Now, this is all awesome and exciting, but these discoveries yeah. are about a lot more than just what dinosaurs look like. They can also tell us about... And I did forget to continue the Microraptor animation. You are totally right there, Dr. Terra. Shoot, where is that? Speaking of Microraptor... Uh, there we go. Uh, Microraptor, we were talking about, uh, oh boy, we were talking about raptor prey restraint and all this good stuff. Check this out. Here is the famous four-winged dinosaur Microraptor. Yeah, and how it may have caught mammals like this. This is based on aerodynamic studies of how the animal would have held its limbs. Very, very cool. Thank you, Dr. Terra. Oh, get wrecked, little mammal. Shoot. Yeah, neat stuff. Um, so again, that was gone over in uh, in this documentary here. They actually did some wind tunnel tests on this creature. Pitch nose up. Yeah. Why didn't you say this earlier? This is a very bright idea. Let's see. This would be a little bit. Shu's idea is to extend the legs almost straight back, yeah. allowing the leg and foot feathers to form a canopy over the tail. Very cool. That's your hypothesis. That's a possible possibility. It's possible. So now they're going to test this. This is the same orientation that you just saw there in that animation. That's an interesting one. There's the wind tunnel. Once again, all eyes are on the lift numbers. Starting low, 112. That canopy is not necessarily a lifting surface. I mean, you know, you really have to have an airfoil to make it a lifting surface. So again, this is this idea of, of doing tests in paleontology. It's not it's not just old bones that we're working on, you know? There are all kinds of tests like these being performed. This is really cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, it would push off with its hind feet and they'd be and, back and they'd be behind. So it would sort of dive and that would be a diving maneuver. 342. Now the lift starts to climb. Ooh, check this out. Yeah. Uh, and Pfizer, yeah, that's Shu Xing right there. One of China's premier dinosaur paleontologists. He is... Xu Xing is a living legend. He really is. Maybe published more dinosaurs than any other living person. You know? Maybe more dinosaurs than any other person alive. Xu Xing. Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. makes for a long, fast glide. But when it's time to stop, it needs help. And that could be where the biplane comes in. Yep. So if this animal jumps off of a tree, as it jumps, its legs are already behind it. Yeah. It's able to dive. It's got a nice 
um, glide ratio going. And then Pfizer, uh, the land, it can start bringing its legs gradually forward through those biplane configurations. Shushig. And then as it brings its legs all the way forward, it's able to pitch up and land on a tree. So the there you go. glide story is going to be this transition from the legs all the way back to the legs all the way forward, which gets you very nicely from the top of the tree to the bottom of the next tree. Very cool. The experiment says that Microraptor could glide very well without splaying its legs. I love the... This is not CGI here. Those are practical effects. Very cool. Yeah. Anyway. Uh... So yeah, yeah. This is exactly what we see... Right here. So this is based on that study. Holy cow, is that cool. So being able to look at the anatomy of a dinosaur that lived 120 million years ago and figure out not just what kind of creature it was, not just what it looked like, but how it would have behaved and what kind of ecological niche it would have existed in, what it would have done for a living based on that information. That is incredibly cool. And also figure out what colors it was at the same time. Extraordinary. That's why I do what I do, you know? This is why I got into dinosaur paleontology. This stuff is incredibly exciting to me. And it's, it's such a joy to be able to share it with all of you. And I am deeply, deeply grateful for that opportunity. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, with that being said, it is now time to wrap up our broadcast. And here is a Deinonychus to run our credits over right here. Don't go away just yet, though, everybody. We are going to... Uh, we're going to go raid into somebody else doing some science on Twitch. We'll see who else is live right now. Let's have ourselves a look here. Hmm. Uh, you know what? Yogurt Garrel is live right now. And she's playing some Tetris. We might go say hello to Yogurt Garrel. I love me some Tetris. So we're going to go say hello to a longtime supporter of this channel. We're going to go right into Yogurt Garrel. That's what we're going to do. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, everybody. For another incredible stream. I, uh... And that didn't work, did it? Hang on a second. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, everybody, for another incredible stream. I really appreciate your enthusiasm, your questions, your financial support. 21 subs, really appreciate that. Thank you for the bits. Thank you, moderators for keeping chat nice and civil and, you know, a safe place to uh, talk about science. Appreciate all of you. I'll be streaming again tomorrow at 2 p.m. California time. So I hope you'll join me then. We might even stream early tomorrow. We'll have to see. Pay, pay attention to the Twitter feed, I guess. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Let's go see what Yogurt Garrel is up to. And I will see you there. <laughs>